All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call to order the afternoon of August 22nd. Tony, would you please call the roll? Jimenez? Present. Torres? Cohen? Here. Ortiz? Present. Davis? Here. Doan? Or Duan? Candelas? Here. Foley? Here. Batra? Present. Kame? Here. Mahan? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. All right, now if you are able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so today's invocation will be given by the Venerable Tik Fab Han of the Peaceful Mind Meditation Center, and Councilmember Duan will tell us more. Thank you, Mayor. Venerable Tik Fab Han grew up in Tua Ting Hue. He started practicing in a temple known as Tudam Temple at the age of seven. The temple was founded by Zen master um, Min Huan Tu Yung, during that period, Zen Master Lu Quan received a Dharma seal from Zen Master Min Huan Tu Yung in 1712. Later, between 1733 and 1735, Zen Master Lu Quan organized three significant or ordination ceremonies, passing the precept to numerous monks and, nun and nuns at the temple. Venerable Tit Phap Han spent years looking for a location to start a temple and after a while, with the help of many devotees, the meditation hall become a reality. <clears throat> he fulfilled his dream in 2014 as a tribute to the founding master and the place where his monastic life started. Venerable Thich Phab Han consistently nurtured the spiritual space through sutra recitation and daily practice. He aimed to help devotees reconnect with their in inherent Buddha nature and understanding the teaching of the Buddha found in the scripture. I'd like to uh, Say little um, vows. Not yet. Okay. Greeting to all city officials, Mayor Mahan, Supervisor, City Councils, and most important of all, San Jose community. It is truly an honor to be here together with everyone for this fine moment. At this moment, I would like to invite everyone to stand up, letting everything go, and mindfully focus together. We will transcend our energy to up San Jose City. Offering up the incense to the Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha. In gratitude, we offer the incense to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattva throughout space and time. May it be fragrant at Earth herself, reflecting our carefully efforts, our wholehearted mindfulness, and the fruits of understanding slowly ripening. May we and all beings be compassion of the Buddha and Bodhisattva. May we awaken from forgetfulness and realize our true home. May all the Buddhas be with us. Invoking Buddha and Bodhisattva name in spot of the city San Jose. Namo Sakyamuni Buddha, the fully awakened one. Namo Manjuri, 
the Bodhisattva of Greek understanding, Namo Sanmanta Bahara, the Bodhisattva of Greek action, Namo Avalokate Sava, the Bodhisattva of Greek compassion, Namo Buddha and Bodhisattva in ten directions. The refugee chain, incense perform the atmosphere, a lotus blossom and the Buddha appears. The war of suffering and discrimination is filled with the light of the rising sun. At the dirt of fear and anxiety, shadow with an open heart and one focused mind. I turn the three jewel, the fully enlightened one, beautifully shaded, peaceful, smiling, and living source of understanding and compassion. To the Buddha, I go for refuge. The path of the mindfulness living, leading to healing, joy, and enlightenment, the way of peace, to the Dharma, I go for refuge. The loving and supportive community of the practice, realizing harmony, awareness, and liberation to the Sangha, I go for refuge. For right now, I invite Bien Doan, Lee, repeat after me. We are aware that the three gems are within my heart. We are aware of the three gems are within our hearts. We vow to realize them, practicing mindfulness, breathing, smiling, and looking deeply into things. We vow to realize them, practicing mindful breathing, smiling, and looking deeply into things. We vow to understand in living beings and their suffering. We vow to understand living beings and their suffering. We vow to cultivate loving kindness and compassion and to practice joy and equanimity. We vow to cultivate loving kindness and compassion and to practice joy and equanimity. We vow to offer joy to one person in the morning and to help release the grief of one person in the afternoon. We vow to offer joy to one person in the morning and to help relieve the grief of one person in the afternoon. We vow to live simply and sanely with feel perception and to keep my body healthy. We vow to live simply and sanely with few possession and keep our body healthy. We vow to let go of all worries and anxiety in order to be light and free. We vow to let go of all worries and anxiety in order to be light and free. We are aware that we own so much to my parents, teachers, friends, and all beings. We are aware that we owe so much to our parents, teachers, friends, and all beings. We vow to be worthy of their trust to practice the Dharma wholeheartedly so that my understanding and compassion will flower. We vow to be worthy of their trust to practice the Dharma wholeheartedly so that our understanding and compassion will flower. Helping living beings to be free from their suffering. Helping living beings to be free from their sufferings. Thank you, Bindo. Chanting, may the day be well and the night is well. May the midday hour bring happiness too. In every minute and every second, by the blessing of the triple gem, Amos to Bodhisattva Avalokates of Greek compassion. I take refuge in the Buddha, the one who showed me the way in this life. Namo Buddhaya. I take refuge in the Dharma, the way of understanding and love. Namo Dharmaja. I take refuge in the Sangha, the community of mindful harmony. Namo Sangha. Sharing the merit. 
May the merit of the practice share with all beings. May we Buddhas, disciples, and all beings be successful in the realization of the path. May the law of the Buddha, or to some of us, is God. Of the higher power, the Dharma and the Sangha support our effort to build a stronger community of the city San Jose. Thank you. Thank you for that invocation. Council members Foley, Davis, and Torres, if you would join me at the podium, we will recognize and proclaim Silicon Valley Pride Week. If the rest of my council colleagues would like to join us as well, please feel free to do so. Good afternoon. I'm council member Pam Foley and I'm joined today by my council colleagues who are co-hosts with me today, council member Omar Torres and council member Dev Davis. As we officially proclaim August 21st through the 27th as Silicon Valley Pride Week. Thank you. We are really lucky that we're here in San Jose. We celebrate Pride with not only Pride Month in June, I know we did this a couple of months ago, but we also celebrate our very own Pride Week because we have a big parade coming up. It's always important for me to start off any Pride event by talking about why we celebrate Pride. Pride began as an event to acknowledge the 1969 Stonewall Riots where members of the gay and trans community were victimized. Since these riots, generations of LGBTQ plus people have fought to obtain protections and rights other groups have achieved, such as the right to marry. Today, these rights, achieved after many years of struggles, continue to be under attack by dangerous legislation and rhetoric across our country. We must not allow our country to return to 1969, depriving our LGBTQ plus community of the rights and protections that they all deserve. And this is closer at hand than you all may think. Just four days ago, Laura Carlton was shot and killed in Southern California after a dispute for displaying her pride flag to show her support for the LGBT community. That cannot happen in California, and it, this, that type of hatred must stop. This is why we must continue to be diligent in continuing to fight to protect our members of the LGBTQ plus community. We must ensure that everyone, no matter who they are or whom they love, has an equal place in our society. I dedicate my life to it. It's not just personal, it's the right thing to do. Throughout this week, we're proud to support Vi Silicon Valley Pride as they host inclusive events and end the week of celebration with a Pride Parade and Festival on Sunday. And I need to give a shout out to a couple of my staff members, in particular, Claire Bang, who's right here, my communications person, and Anna, my intern over there, who made these beautiful, pride bracelets that we'll be handing out at the pride parade. It's a labor of love and time intensive, and I am so grateful, they're just beautiful. Thank you so much for doing that. As one of this week's events, we're proud to host tonight's flag raising and lighting ceremony here at City Hall at 5 p.m. As we light City Hall in rainbow pride colors and raise the rainbow, rainbow and trans flag. Without further delay, I'm delighted to invite one of the many individuals from Silicon Valley Pride Organization who works hard and volunteers their time and energy to create a more inclusive and vibrant LGBTQ plus community here in Silicon Valley. As I call her forward, may her please present Nicole Altamirano with our proclamation. 
Please join me in giving a warm welcome to the CEO of Silicon Valley Pride. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Uh -huh. <laughs> Small things, right? Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Council Member Foley, uh, Council Member Torres, and Council Member Davis. I'm sorry, it's been a week. Uh, you know, happy Silicon Valley Pride Week, happy Silicon Valley Pride Month, and happy Pride Year Round. We are so blessed to be in the city of San Jose where we celebrate not only the month of June, which is historically Gay Pride Month, but also Silicon Valley Pride Month, the month of August. Thank you all for coming out. You know, this year our theme is Live Out Proud. And as Council Member Foley just described, the hatred that is still alive and well in this country and across the world, living out proud is more relevant today than it was yesterday. It's just as relevant as it was in 1969, and it's just as relevant as it's going to be next year and the years to come. Pride was born out of a need not to celebrate, but out of a need to live free from persecution. And that's what living out proud is. For the majority of us, living out proud is something that we can easily take for granted here in the Bay Area. It's something that we could easily think, oh, everybody can do it. But what we can see what just happened in Southern California and what we can see that is happening across the United States, that that is not the case for everybody. This is hitting a little bit close to home for us here in the progressive state of California. But it reminds us that we need to be diligent with our fight and our pursuit for equity and equality. It reminds us that we cannot just say, oh, that's happening across the country. Oh, that's happening in one of those red states. We don't need to worry about it because it could happen anywhere. It could happen in your schools. It could happen in your place of employment. It could happen in your homes. And what's more, most important is that we don't celebrate and we don't become allies just in the month of June just during Silicon Valley Pride, but we stand up and we rise up and we speak out every single day whenever you see hatred, whenever you see bigotry, whenever you see transphobia, whenever you see homophobia. It's important because we need our allies in this fight. So I, I am so grateful to our city council. I know the majority of you will be at our Pride Parade this Sunday. I cannot wait for all of it and to see the beautiful eclectic community that we celebrate with our LGBTQ plus celebration. Happy Pride, everyone. And make sure you visit svpride.com to see all of our events going on. Thank you very much. All right, Council Members Batra and Foley, if you join me at the podium, we will recognize Silicon Valley Career Technical Education. Technology, technology, yeah, that's good. Thank you, thank you. Get all of our team here. Good. Good afternoon. Today, I would like to commend a partnership that started in November 2022. This is a partnership between Silicon Valley Career Technical Education under the leadership of the Superintendent Alisa Lynch. Other partners are our own work to future, our city's HR department. SVCTE, as it is known, been committed to investing in San Jose's youth since 1917. 
by introducing students to real world and thoughtful academic careers, curriculums. They offer cutting edge technology while utilizing industry professionals to support a variety of technical training opportunities offered through its facility. This partnership was established among these three departments with the purpose of equipping and providing our marginalized youth with an opportunity to complete their training, all the while presenting paid avenues for growth. As they conclude their training, they gain the ability to grow their skills in pursuit of a prosper career. Through this collaboration, they have managed to facilitate internships for 48 individuals, out of which 37 have successfully finalized their training, while the remaining 11 are currently in progress. Thank you to SVCTE, Work to Future, and our city staff for continuously being dedicated to enabling our students with opportunities for future career pathways. I hope you can continuously enroll the same, if not more, students every year going forward. This collaboration is yielding a pipeline of very talented, well-trained professionals to come and work in the city and serve our city and the community with their acquired skills. So I'm proud that this thing is serving the youth in our own city, an institution which has been in since 1977, 17, 1917, get me correct, 1917, in our own backyard. And I really appreciate this collaboration which is established in 2022 and Mayor, it will lead a lot of very talented people which we need to fill our vacancies with. So I would invite the superintendent of SVCTE to receive this commendation. Okay. On, behalf, on behalf of Metro Ed, I'd like to thank you and Silicon Valley CTE is one of our entities. This is a long time waiting. I want to thank Council Member uh, Batra, uh, the mayor, and Pam Foley, who knows us really well, as she sat on the San Jose Unified School District Board for many years. And then I want to thank Jennifer McGuire, the city manager, and uh, Pat Freitas, who brought this partnership together. And um, Pat brought uh, Jennifer out to see our center and how it's changed over the years. And then next I'd like to thank Joelle Hansen, our Director of Workforce Development, and Mirza Hansler from Work to Future for coming together. As Council Member Batra said, last year we had 28 students take advantage of an internship and the City of San Jose paid $168,000. And we look forward to working with additional partners on this coming year. We are a model of excellence at our center. We pride ourselves on what we do for this community. So thank you for your time and recognition.
All right, and last but not least, Councilor Torres, please join me at the podium and we will recognize the McKinley Bonita Neighborhood Association. All righty. So before we begin, I actually have a little explanation. The McKinley Bonita Neighborhood Association is here and they are amazing, but because one of their neighborhood leaders and business owner is really humble, she never really wanted to come in to get recognized on her own. So, Carmen, esta es una sorpresa para usted. Le vamos a dar un, un commendation. So, <laughs> Carmen, yo y, y tus vecinos, Queremos expresar nuestro más sincero agradecimiento a usted por su dedicación a la comunidad. Tu contribución a lo largo de los años ha hecho una diferencia positiva en la vida de tantas personas. También, gracias por su increíble comida que todos disfrutamos. Me encantan tus flautas. Her flautas are great. Gracias, Carmen, por ser, por ser una inspiración a nuestra comunidad, especialmente a la comunidad de McKinley Bonita. And then I'm going to say a few more words in English, so bear with me. The Spanish is done, so that's the good part. Today, we're here to spotlight Carmen Vidrio, owner of Lorena Taqueria on North 13th Street. Born in 1952 during the Korean War, Carmen's roots are, connect, were, are were connected to the Bracero program a chapter in the history that saw her parents answer the call for opportunities in the United States. Carmen started her entrepreneurial journey with a catering truck in the 70s. Her first gig was in Los, An Los Angeles serving American hot lunches. In 1979, she made a bold move to San Jose founding Taqueria Lorenas, a lunch truck, a story we often hear here in our beautiful city. This step eventually led her to establish not one, but five restaurants by 1984. Today, 44 years since she started, Carmen is still at the helm of her business that has become a San Jose icon. Beyond her restaurants, Carmen heartbeats for her community. She has been the rock for the McKinley Bonita and the Olinder neighborhoods in downtown San Jose. The revamped Ocopio restaurant stands as a testament to her commitment to those neighborhoods. Actively involved in the McKinley Bonita, the McKinley Bonita Neighborhood Association, Carmen donates not only her amazing flautas, at every meeting, but her time as a neighbor and a volunteer. Carmen is also a founder of the Latino Parent Coalition of the Eastside Union High School District. Together, they've rallied for students, raising funds, and granting scholarships, helping dreams take flight. Carmen Vidrio, Vidrio, Carmen Vidrio is, isn't just a business owner, she's the embodiment of grit, entrepreneurship, and community love. Congratulations, Carmen. Yeah. <laughs> Pues esta es una gran sorpresa para mí, estoy agradecida con todos ustedes y le doy gracias a Dios porque me puso en este camino, me dio unos adorables hijos, los cuales me envolvieron en todo esto porque yo quería guiar a mis hijos bien, en el buen camino. Y después mis vecinos los conocí, son amables, cariñosos, compartimos como una gran familia y yo los quiero a todos, los chamacos, me gusta cómo se superan. Quisiera que todos, todos, en realidad, hiciéramos un bien por nuestra comunidad. Yo de corazón les digo, me encanta estar con toda la comunidad. Los extraño cuando a veces no tenemos una junta, pero para mí es parte de mi familia. Y parte de, de esa familia me hacen feliz. Gracias a ustedes por hacerme el día, por el año, los tiempos. Me borran todas las estreses que a veces tengo. Con ellos son una gran familia. Gracias a todos ustedes. Los quiero mucho. Please. It'll, it'll be brief. First of all, I'd like to thank Lorena for getting 
uh, Carmen here. <laughs> yeah, a, lot, a lot of things have been said, nice things about uh, Carmen here. She's a super lady. Estamos super orgullosos. We're super mm -hmm. proud of what she's done in the past 15 years. Now, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of stuff is anonymous, what she does. During COVID, in our neighborhood, it got real hard. It got hit real hard. She was there. Simple phone calls, whole family with COVID, or anonymous food donations, which people with lack of resources got to enjoy. Mm -hmm. And she continues this. To this day, we're very proud. We're, uh, we're all, you know, we all volunteer for certain reasons. Some of the main reasons that I volunteer is, of course, the 10 main reasons then, plus friendships. I think I can say, Carmen, this is a lifetime uh, friend for all of us. All of us, we enjoy her. She's a super lady. And we're proud. We're really proud. And we thank all of you guys for listening to what we got to say about Carmen. Yeah. And I thank you. Give you a Carmen. Yay. 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 All right, we are on to orders of the day. Does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? Not seeing any, we will move on to the closed session report. Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. Okay, great. And I, I should have just noted, I am going to take uh, land use consent right after the consent calendar for anyone who's following along. Um, thank you, Nora. So we are on to the consent calendar, and are there any items the council would like to pull from consent? I'm not seeing any. Do we have public comment on consent? I have Paul Soto followed by Blair. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'd like to restrict my comments to item 212 on the consent calendar. This is about the psychological testing of police officers. I think with the Antioch Police Department and what happened there in Pittsburgh and the history of what has happened in our San Jose Police Department, I think that this item needs to be pulled. I'm asking that it be pulled from consent and that we have discussion about this. Because this is, number one, the dollar amount is very low. You should, this should be, this should be resourced at a, at a higher level and hire maybe a couple of consultants, a couple of psychologists. And I would also like to have installed into the policeman's contract that periodically, like after three years, you see, because you have a police officer that's going in from the academy, okay? Then he's be gonna become infected. And it is an infection. Racism is an infection. And we can no longer deny that racism has polluted the integrity and the dignity of the officers there. Not all of them but it does exist and it is endemic to the police department. And I think Antioch and Pittsburgh has proven that because what Antioch and Pittsburgh officers did is not news to my community. It's not news. It may be news to you people, but it's not news to my community. My community has constantly, the Chicano community has constantly had these issues, these racist cops inside these police departments and we need to get them out of there. We need to root them out of there. So we need to put as a part of the contract that they'd be psychologically evaluated every three years. And that this is just a mandatory standard practice. I think that's just. I think that the past history, the recent history, with dealing drugs out of the police department's union, I think would warrant that. We need to see what kind of psychology these cops are working with after they've been polluted by the cultural uh, conditioning that they receive as a 
Blair followed by Mike. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thank you for finding uh, my right Zoom channel. I got two Zoom channels today. You found the right one. Uh, thank you. I'll be speaking on this channel today. Um, thanks for the words to Paul Soto. Man, I haven't heard him for a few months now, and it's uh, nice to hear his voice, that he's okay, that he's around, and uh, good words from him. Thank you. I also wanted to comment on item 212, that uh, along with the Vallejo police, uh, Antioch and Pittsburgh police, a pretty tough group that I think, uh, you know, their time has come, that uh, reform measures are coming, and it's good for that. I hope we learn important lessons uh, from that, uh, from what they're going through right now. Uh, back after the George Floyd incidents of 2020, uh, a whole set of new ideas came through to local governments about issues around what uh, item 212 was about, uh, psychological therapy, uh, mental health therapy, uh, ways that police can counsel themselves uh, and talk to each other better, more openly and more clearly. Uh, it's really important goals to work on that we kind of uh, sublimated and uh, tucked away. Um, they kind of started to go to work within domestic violence issues, police learning how to talk to each other after domestic uh, violence issues better. I think that was an important goal. Hopefully we're returning uh, the concepts of just good uh, counseling services for each other and making it an open process. Uh, when you do that, you, you lessen tension, you lessen fear, and uh, you build trust. And that's, that's the whole point after the Joy Floyd things of what we need to be building. So good luck in these efforts and, uh, and other items like this we'll be talking about today at uh, council. Thank you. Mike, followed by Catherine. Hi, this is Mike Sattergren, PAC San Jose. Um, if I understood uh, what the mayor just said, uh, there, there's going to be comments about um, agenda item 10.1A. Is that correct? Um, it will be the next item. Should I hold my comments? Yes. Thank you. Catherine? Um, good afternoon. This is Catherine Hedges. I live in District 3 downtown. I'm a member of showing up for racial justice at Sacred Heart. And uh, I really appreciated Paul Soto's comments and what he was saying really tracks with what our accountability partners at SB Debug have been saying about the police. So I second what he said and also what Blair was discussing. Thanks very much. Back to council. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion on the consent calendar? I'll move motion approval. Accept. Okay, I heard a motion to approve from Councilor Cohen, second from Dwan. Let's vote. Still waiting on one vote. There we go. Great. It's unanimous. We are now going to take up the land use consent item. And don't believe we have a presentation. Do we have any um, public comment? Yes, Mike. Thank you, uh, Council, uh, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Um, I am not fully up to date on the subject. I'm sorry, my dog is doing something under the table here. Um, the, uh, the project site for this annexation and the proposed project to build the townhouses um, does appear to have um, a property in the center, just a windshield survey. Um, because this is passing from the county to San Jose. I don't believe it's listed on the Historic, historic Resources Inventory. I don't know if it's listed on the Her Historic Heritage uh, Commission's inventory for the county, but it does appear to be a property that would have been um, a turn of the century farmhouse. And um, I'm just anticipating that there may be a historic uh, report required 
and out of fairness to the developer and city and trying to expedite the process of developing housing, I just felt like it was important to bring that up. So thank you. Paul, followed by Blair. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. As you know, I have been working um, in conjunction with the Preservation Action Council for the past couple of years in, uh, in the capacity of establishing the his history of Chicanismo, the Chicano movement, lowrider movement, and the farm worker movement history. And we've been able to successfully do that in the spaces and places where this history has occurred. Now, this, the comments that, that Mike Sodergren had stated is important because this work is very, very new. And we haven't really had the opportunities to map out. This is gonna be a project in, like it's going to take at least a decade to really map out what is, is that is needed to be protected and what doesn't. Now, the council had given a few years back the council order, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that, and thank you for the work that Dana does. So it's only one person, but Dana has done a lot of work in that particular area. And I would just like to expand on that work and expand and support the work that the Preservation Action Council, but they are very small as well. And we can only do so many things at so many times. I'm doing the Chicano piece. They're doing their piece. And like, for instance, the Graves home. We lost that home to, to, uh, to uh, neglect. Neglect of protecting that particular property, which would have been saved and been given its proper designation. And so I, I'm in support of what Mike Sodergren is talking about, principally, that we need to give things time before we start just passing these things on consent calendars or on the stand use. We need to take a closer examination of these properties and their significance to the identity of San Jose. Thank you. Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the words of the first speaker on this item today. Uh, I'm interested uh, as well, uh, the historic nature of this uh, site. Uh, it has a really nice, soft feeling about it. Um, I, I, I attend the uh, health clinic that's across the street from it. Uh, it, it uh, it's, that's the, uh, that's where I get my medical services, basically. It seems a really good uh, place to develop uh, some sort of low-income housing that can be close to, say, the hospital area. It's next to uh, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, medical center and, and things, and um, a Valley Mental Health or Valley Health Center. Um, AACI is where I go, and that's also right there. There's pharmacies there, there's a lot of doctor's offices. To develop some forms of uh, low-income housing, I think would be really interesting for this area and really respectful, and, and respectful to just the feeling this uh, area and site creates that, uh, Good luck in considering those things and not just making it a townhouse for you know eighty thousand dollars and up. Uh, really consider people of lower income and and mixed income ideas. This is a, a perfect place to consider the future of mixed income ideas and how those work together in in a neighborhood that has a lot of good good substantial housing that uh, can support uh, some some lower income things. I think. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, good afternoon, Catherine Hedges here, and I'd like to second what Blair Beekman and the previous speaker just said, and this would be a great site for low-income mixed income or social housing. Um, so I hope that we do not rush ahead and just put more um, market rate or luxury townhomes on the site. Uh, we're running out of good places to develop in San Jose and we're not gonna be able to meet our uh, low-income housing goals if we're using all of them for market rate or above. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you, do we have a second? Councilor Dwan? Great, I don't see any other hands, let's vote.
Motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're on to the report of the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. I have no report today. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. On to item 3.3 which is the amendment to the agreement with TransDev Services for airport shuttle bus services. There's no staff presentation, so we'll go to public comment. Blair. Hi, Blair. Blair here. Uh, for this item, um, in, in now living in San Diego, uh, the main uh, bus service, uh, the transit service uses TransDev as their main uh, facilitator of transportation. Um, they've run into a bit of problems uh, in the past few months. They're working through them, uh, but there's a disorganization between uh, and a disconnect between uh, San Diego, uh, the, the transit service and TransDev that they're trying to work through. And it, it, it comes down to a morale issue that I mentioned at this time that uh, we're in, in San Jose with BTA issues, you know, morale, the building of morale is important at this time, really important. And uh, it just, it, good luck in, in building connections with TransDev and making sure that they're doing their job clearly and, and in good organized fashion. And if you do that, that's morale building. And that's uh, important things to be working on and considering. And uh, uh, how we all can be moving forward into a future that uh, there's some promising things that, that could be happening in San Diego. Uh, and it's it's good morale and it's good organization that I hope uh, TransDev can, can take to heart and that maybe you can show them some good examples here in San Jose that you can, you, you have an awesome way to be very well organized and financially uh, together. That could be a real help uh, to everyone. Uh, so thanks for your time and your Patience and hear me uh, with my explanations on the side. Thanks. Back to council. Great. Thank you. Not seeing any hands. Do we have a motion? I'll move approval. Second. Great. Uh, Councilor Dwan, did you have any? Were you just going to make a motion? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Okay, I think we're ready to vote. That the city trusts this bright tree uh, uh, tree service to provide services of tree pruning. They obviously are arborists, so they know what they're doing. What I'd like to see is the city contracting with them that whenever an issue about tree removal and tree replacement comes up, like that one in that disaster, embarrassing disaster that happened in North San Jose. When all of these trees are going to be cut out and you guys got no plan to install any, you have already access, accessible, an organization like this for the purposes of consultation that, hey, this is what we can do with this kind of project. So something embarrassing like that doesn't happen again because it was embarrassing. It was an item that had came up on the consent calendar and got shot right to the, uh, to the uh, discussion because of that issue, because I was bringing that up in the planning commission. And they were stuttering, they were stumbling with the words in terms of, yeah, well, we're gonna remove all this stuff, all these trees, but we have really no plans to put it there, but yet it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an electronic data center that's going to uh, be green and uh, protect the, uh, it, was, it was climate smart, I guess is the words you guys use. So, and it was a mockery because you can't be climate smart if you're removing trees. It, it just, it goes against that. Trees are lungs. It's where we get oxygen. So what I'm asking is that you start using arborists like this as, consul as consultants so that when issues happen like that, you don't get embarrassed and you already have somebody on, on, on call to be able to advise you and walk you through it so you don't look Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Thanks for the words of Paul. Um, it's my personal feeling that uh, a few years ago, uh, we were starting to go a little foul 
in how to uh, work keep tree pruning and, and cutting down trees in San Jose. And um, it was a bit worrisome. And there's been a lot of public meetings about the future of tree planting and tree use uh, the past couple years that I think was so much good dialogue that uh, a more natural sense of how pruning should can work uh, in San Jose has been created. It's my real hope that that's what's happened. And uh, you, there's always reasons that you, you guys have been cutting down trees, but it was pretty shocking what was going on a couple years ago. And I think I'm hoping that's mellowed and that there's a more of a, a dialogue before trees are cut or, or pruned. And uh, I think it has. I think that conversation is taking place and, and more realistic understandings uh, are, are developed on how to uh, address tree issues and, and disease issues. So um, overall, just uh, thanks uh, for this item and good luck in continuing practices of a, of a community process in, in deciding uh, tree pruning and, and cutting. Thank you. Back to council. Great. Thank you, Tony. See any hands? Do you have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Great. Okay, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you. Okay, so we're on to item 3.5, report on bids and award of contract for upgrades to elevators at a few city parking garages. Once again, no presentations. We will go to public comment. Blair? Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. In the work I do with tech accountability uh, for an item like this, uh, the, the, the upgrades of, of elevators, there's going to be, it's a serious upgrade issue. I mean, it's a $4 million, $5 million amount. That's a lot. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's going to be in these upgrades, uh, you know, new video cameras, new surveillance equipment within the, uh, the elevators. Are they going to be biometric cameras? Are you willing to be able to be open to talk about that sort of subject? Are you fearful to talk about such a subject with the public? Or can that be an honest conversation? I think if you can, um, then we'll be, I'm looking, always looking for ways uh, how tech accountability can be a more open, clear process, and that we want to talk about tech accountability issues and, uh, and, and, and public policy practices and any ways that a city government wants to learn to do that with its community and offer that and give of that. That's a real growth process, and that's trust, and that's, uh, I hope this item can be a way to break through the barriers of, of fear, and uh, that it's difficult for government to trust giving information to the community. I think biometric uh, tech, it will be really important in this issue, uh, that is a factor in, in how you're going to decide about things. That needs to be talked about openly with the public, and, and I hope you don't fear that conversation. We have to get to the point we don't, we don't feel the conversations. We're simply not a poor anymore. We're, we're at a place of peace and sustainability, and that's how you talk about our better community future and uh, quality of life practices. So good luck in-, in, in Tony, I don't think this is on topic. Open. Okay. Well, we may be in time. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from The Horseshoe. My concern is that you have a $4 million contract you're talking about safety. The upgrades that you have in there are going to be about surveillance. There's data collection issues. There, there's a lot of issues in this. And see, whenever people like myself and Blair come at the city, and because that's our responsibility as citizens, is to comment on every single one of these items and keep a check on my government. I do not trust you. There's no reason why we should trust our government. There's absolutely none. And this is the reason why there's no staff report on $4 million of my tax money. Uh-uh. No. That should be an embarrassment to public works or whatever department that you have that is going to take care of this. That's an embarrassment to them. This is a call out to them. 
and whomever within the city stop them from giving the presentation. I want to know what that $4 million is going to buy me. I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm funny that way. I like to know information about what my government is doing because I don't trust you. I don't trust anything that you're doing. I don't trust the people that you contract with, and I don't trust the work that's being done in there and what is going to result from that. I'm sorry, I'm funny that way. I'm just a citizen that is doing everything that is that is that that I'm actually compelled to do via the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So I, I'd like a report. I'd like this to be put over and to have a report given on these items to answer those questions that I gave just uh, just a couple of seconds ago. Because until you do, you've given us no reason. So we're supposed to sit back and just assume, uh, yeah, just trust us. We got the right. No, 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 no. We trusted you too much, and we've seen what we've gotten. Back to council. Great. Thank you. Let's see any hands. Do we have a motion? Great. Let's vote. Okay, so you have a different sorry. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Excellent. So we are on to item 4.1, Police Department Reform and Operational Improvement Recommendations Status Report, and there is a staff presentation for this item. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, City Manager, uh, Council, uh, Police Chief Anthony Mata here. Along with me is Lieutenant uh, Paul Hamblin and Peter Hamilton of the uh, City Manager's Office uh, here um, to provide you a status report on the Police Department's reform and operational improvement recommendation status as recommended by the uh, Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee on May 18th, 2023. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of um, the presentation, uh, as you may know, as a result of the police reforms, we received over 536 recommendations uh, to improve our operations. I'm happy to report that 254 have been completed, uh, and another 199 we agree with, of which 104 are currently in progress. Uh, so with that, um, Lieutenant Paul Hamblin will um, provide you with more detail on the status of these uh, recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I'll start today by providing a brief history of the recommendations, and then we'll talk about the status of the recommendations and see how much progress we've made. And finally, we'll look at where we're going from here and answer any questions. This list of recommendations is the result of a great deal of work and collaboration between the department and numerous stakeholders from the community and other city departments. On March 1st, 2022, the City Council approved the San Jose Police Department's response to the reports by the CNA Corporation, an independent auditor sanctioned by the department. The reports were titled Use of Force Assessment of the San Jose Police Department and 21st Century Policing Assessment of the San Jose Police Department. Then two months later, the city council's, or sorry, the city manager's office presented reports from the Reimagining Public Safety Community Advisory Committee and the Charter Review Commission Public Safety Recommendations to City Council. On November 17, 2022, the department provided its first report to the PISFIS Committee on these recommendations for police reform and operational improvement. This report included analysis of implementation to date and a review of outstanding recommendations. 
After the report, the department was directed to return and provide a status update in six months, which we did at PISVIS in May, as the chief said. And what follows is that update. There are currently 539 recommendations from 11 sources tracked by the department. 501 of which are managed by the department, 36 of which are managed by the city manager's office. Additionally, the city's code enforcement division and the city attorney's office each manage one item. The largest contributor to the list is the CNA 21st Century Policing Audit with 124 recommendations, followed by recommendations by the San Jose Independent Police Auditor with 106, and the Reimagining Public Safety Advisory Committee with 71. 267 of the 530 recommendations, or roughly 50%, are completed. There are 189 recommendations remaining to be completed. There are 57 recommendations amounting to 11% that were deemed impractical and will not be implemented. The recommendations address a wide range of priorities and issues, from recruiting and staffing to community engagement to department member wellness. Most recommendations involve changing policy, 286, followed by training and community engagement, both 50, and transparency. Now let's take a look at the progress we've made in the past nine months. This graph shows where we are today compared to where we were in November of 2022. There are two markers in particular we want to look at. The first is completed items, which ideally would have gone up in the past nine months. And the second is agreed but not started, which ideally would have gone down during that time. As you can see, the number of items completed, shown in yellow, has climbed from 226 to 267. And the number of items that we agreed with but had not started, red, has gone down from 120 to 92. Both of these markers show solid progress, and I'm extremely optimistic that these numbers will continue to go up. As my staff was gathering data for this report, it was noticeable how many items were on the brink of being completed. So I have no doubt that the number of completed items will make an even greater leap by our next report. Now let's look at some of our accomplishments over the past six months. These are all items that address specific recommendations. The Executive Force Review Committee. The EFRC convenes regularly to review use of force incidents. The committee is comprised of department command officers identified by the Office of Chief, who are especially trained in force analysis and decision making under stress. The committee analyzes force applied during an event, identifying any observed misconduct, identifying any training opportunities, and documenting their analyses for review by the chain of command. Implementation of department-wide training. Since our last report, the department has completed the LGBTQ plus awareness training, which was attended by every sworn and non-sworn member of the department. The department is currently providing officers with a training called Why'd You Stop Me? This nine hour course teaches officers communications techniques to improve interactions between the police and the public. We are continuing to teach procedural justice which stresses a customer service model of policing by instilling the principles of treating people with respect and dignity and giving them a voice. The entire department has received this training and we're continuing to provide it to our academy classes and new lateral hires. The department's next major undertaking is a multi-layered racial equity training, which will include both online courses and multiple in-person classes. Mobile Crisis Assessment Team. MCAT is fully functional, deploying a team consisting of one sergeant and three officers every day of the week. MCAT operates on a co-response model of deployment, which pairs specially trained officers with licensed mental health clinicians. The team responds to non-urgent follow-up requests and, when appropriate and safe, to in-progress calls for community members experiencing mental health crisis. 
language action plan. The department updated its language action plan to provide limited English proficient individuals with timely and meaningful access to available programs, services, and benefits. And we offer a conversational Spanish class to our academies and our veteran officers. So now where do we go from here? Moving forward, we will continue to work toward implementing the agreed but not started and currently in progress items. One such item is the community engagement consultant. This non-sworn full-time employee who the department is in the process of hiring will provide evaluation and recommendations on community engagement, relationship building, participation in department activities, training, and policy direction. Now Peter Hamilton, assistant to the city manager, will discuss some of the items the city manager's office is working on. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Peter Hamilton, assistant to the city manager. And uh, I, in this section of the presentation, I will uh, provide you with a little bit more detailed look at our efforts to implement recommendations of the Reimagining Public Safety Committee. And as you know, the Reimagining Public Safety Committee was a uh, community-led public process uh, that had two major pieces of scope. One was to identify opportunities for reform within the police department, uh, and the second was uh, to identify uh, alternative approaches to public safety uh, that, did not, that did not involve the police. Uh, and uh, this, again, was a community-led body. It was driven by um, the community leaders on, on the committee, not by staff. And uh, they brought forward their recommendations to the city council in spring of 2022. Uh, and their report included 50 recommendations in the main report. There was an attachment from their youth advisory committee that had 38 additional recommendations. So quite a few recommendations, and you know, on top of the over 500 in the, the main list. So in conversation between uh, staff in the city manager's office and uh, the Real Coalition, which is a, um, a group of uh, community leaders who were also members of the reimagining committee, uh, we decided that it would probably be a good idea, instead of you know, pursuing them all at once, to identify a few priority projects um, uh, from among the reimagining recommendations that we could pursue over, over this year. Uh, so back in uh, January of this year, uh, staff in the city manager's office began meeting with the Real Coalition, and out of those conversations and out of um, uh, direction we received from the city council during the budget process, we've identified three priority projects. Oh. I'll provide you some, some detail on, on those projects here. Uh, so the first project is has to do with um, violence prevention efforts. Um, many, ci it's, uh, many cities are experimenting with various ways um, to intervene and prevent violence before it happens. Uh, this is a approach that is familiar in San Jose. Our um, Youth Empowerment Alliance is an example of a violence prevention program. Uh, but with the increased popularity of this approach across the country, there is a proliferation of different uh, approaches to violence prevention, not just focused on youth, but um, focused on gun violence prevention, domestic violence prevention, street outreach, a variety of different um, uh, you know, uh, approaches to this, to, to, this, uh, to this concept. And this is a, a violence prevention efforts were a theme running throughout the reimagining report and something that um, the, the advocates we've been speaking to continue to be very interested in. Uh, so st the staff has proposed that a, a good first step may be for staff to bring forward a research report to the PISFIS community uh, this December on uh, best practices uh, in other local jurisdictions on violence prevention. Uh, so we would, uh, it would be a kind of an overview of what other cities are doing uh, and what, what, uh, what has evidence to show that it's working and where opportunities may be um, for, for San Jose to expand its efforts in this area. Uh, so that, again, coming to, uh, scheduled to come to PISFIS in December. 
The second project, th this was directed in the uh, mayor's March budget message, and the direction was uh, for staff to conduct a analysis of 911 calls received by the police department and identify uh, categories of calls that might be appropriate to respond with uh, an, an alternative type of response. Uh, and this is also something that many other cities are looking at, and you know, we're uh, common areas for kind of uh, alternative responses would be mental health issues, homeless issues, um, uh, substance abuse. Uh, and uh, th so this project would involve um, uh, a few components. One, um, a, a partnership between the manager's office and the police department to analyze the call data for the police department to understand what calls are coming in and identify call types that may be uh, appropriate for some kind of alternative approach. And, all, and uh, we'd also, again, look at other jurisdictions around the country, look at other models that are being implemented and identify best practices. Uh, and the, the deliverable here would be we would come before the city council with a report in January that would identify opportunities for alternative response and uh, the associated resource needs. Uh, the final one, uh, this is a uh, item that was, um, uh, was uh, allocated budget in uh, the, the uh, current year adopted budget. Um, it was, a, again, a, came out of a proposal from the reimagining committee. Uh, the proposal here is to develop um, some enhanced community-based services to um, prevent uh, domestic violence and to support um, the family members and survivors of domestic violence in the community. Um, and the proposal is um, to uh, bring, a, bring a consultant on board uh, to uh, help develop this program. Uh, again, other cities have been doing this, but there is an interest from uh, the, the reimagining committee to um, design a program that is um, specific to the needs of our community. Uh, so that would be the purpose of this consultant. Uh, staff is currently developing an RFP for the consultant. We would anticipate releasing it in October and bringing a consultant on board in March, uh, when, at which point they would con commence work to design, um, design these services um, as, an, as a, a support to survivors of domestic violence. Um, we would uh, look to report back uh, with a status update on this project to the PISCAS committee in May along with our annual report on uh, police reform recommendations. Um, and just to close, say that um, you know, I think we appreciate our partnership with the, the members of the reimagining committee who are uh, continuing to advocate on this. As also, we appreciate uh, the manager's office appreciates the partnership with the police department in advancing these issues and uh, look forward to bringing these forward for you over the coming year. Thank you. Great. And is that the conclusion of the presentation? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation, Lieutenant Chief Peter. Uh, and all the progress that's been made. We'll come back for discussion. Do we have public comment? Paul Soto, followed by Catherine. Uh, yes, hello, Chief Mata. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Chief Mata for his progress in involving the community in these processes. Now, I, I, and I consider Chief Mata in the vein of Chief Covarrubias and Chief McNamara, because they were doing the same kind of community engagement processes, and they were successful for it, and our community, the Chicano community, respected them for it. And I, and I extend that same very respect in this generation to Chief Mata. Secondly, the community person that you want to hire to mediate, I want to interview that person. I want personally to interview that person. I don't want the cops hiring this person I want to interview them. So what I'm asking for is a council recommendation for this person, their record, their background. I want to know how much experience they have dealing with the Chicano community, not Latinx, not the Latino, Chicanos, because we're still here. And we have a history of issues with this police department. Thirdly, is I don't like the fact, see, this was a part of the police department self-examination. And then you started talking about these things that are external. 
like 911 calls, violence, domestic violence. No, 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 no. This is about you. This is about you and what you did to our people when we were exercising our constitutionally protected right to deal with the, to uh, redress our government for our grievances and speech and freedom of assembly. Now, in our exercise of that, we all know what happened. And the racist cops that we still have in the police department, that's what this is about. This isn't about anything external. This is about something that's very subjective to the police department. And I would suggest that we keep the focus there and stop. Catherine? Uh, good afternoon, Catherine Hedges, District 3, showing up for racial justice. Um, and uh, I agree that it's good that we've had a process that has involved the community, but I agree with Paul that we need to continue to involve the community in these processes. His suggestion of uh, having the community, particularly the Chicano community, involved in interviews of these consultants is an excellent idea. And also it seems like some of the items on the recommendations that were originally supposed to be community led have been pulled into the police department. So basically the cat is saying, let me bell myself and I promise not to hunt the mice anymore. And that's not what RIPS was about. RIPS was about the community taking back uh, the more social work things that police don't even want to be involved in. They don't like those calls. Um, they don't want to come out when somebody is talking themselves on a street corner or whatever, uh, but they're standing in the way of having trust do that. Um, I've heard from at least one council member that the police union has talked to them and said, well, we don't think trust is going to work. We don't think community response to domestic violence are going to work. So you shouldn't support it. Um, that's not really the police's call to make. And if they're always complaining about being overworked and understaffed, why are they trying to uh, keep these tasks that they didn't want to do in the first place? It seems like a hypocrisy or conflict or something. But anyway, the police should not be in charge of community response. Back to council. Great, thank you, Tony. Okay, we will head to comment and get back on the right screen. Apologies. I believe I saw council member Batra first. Yes, go ahead, council member. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that comprehensive report and the progress made on these items. 536, as I said last time, is a pretty impressive number for making improvements. Uh, and you seem to have completed a, quite a large number of them. Uh, I do want to go back to the question on the 57, which you have determined will not be completed. Uh, which says that they will not be completed or 11% of the recommendation. Could you just tell us who determined that they will not be suitable for us to use or be worked on? Sure, Council Member, I'll, uh, I'll start and then uh, staff can jump in. So when we, look at all, when we looked at all these uh, recommendations, we looked at it uh, through a lens uh, which is also highlighted in the um, um, in the memo uh, where, you know, are these recommendations interconnected to current policies, uh, legal, are they legally um, okay, uh, things of that nature. Also looked at staffing limitations, budget constraints uh, was another uh, thing that we looked at, workload capacity, meet and confer process, right, because we, we can't uh, implement some things without uh, speaking with, uh, with the union if it uh, creates some type of uh, change in working conditions. Uh, and then also we looked at uh, any cross-agency collaboration, you know, whether uh, the county, the state, or someone else can, can help us out with, with those, uh, and, or if these recommendations uh, is someone else's responsibility. So we used all that to determine uh, those uh, specific um, recommendations that we're going to work on and not work on. So the 57 
uh, that uh, we disagree with um, did not meet uh, the threshold uh, for moving forward with those. Uh, Chief, that's a good way to determine it. Would it be helpful if somebody else from the outside world was also involved in looking at those, whether those 57 could maybe, you said some budget maybe reason sometime else, could it be helpful if somebody from outside looked at it and maybe if there's something worthwhile and the budget is the issue, we go and try to get the budget for it? Sure, those uh, 57 are listed. Uh, they're part of the appendix uh, for the, um, of this report and the prior reports. Uh, we can definitely take a look at those and, um, and see who um, will be willing to take those on. Again, um, if for us, it didn't meet that, that criteria, so that's why we're not gonna move forward with them. Okay, and, and these are one-time collection of uh, improvements. Is there any internal mechanism going on where you're constantly evaluating because these 536 is an impressive number, by the way, and uh, the internal mechanism to go on with the next set of, hopefully not 536, to be developed, uh, but a list of something which you would be putting it on the table? So part of um, our, part of our newly created uh, strategic plan for the police department, one of the goals is continuous improvement and innovation. So uh, when we get, again, these uh, recommendations or any recommendation, we're gonna use that same lens right, to see how, you know, the workload, you know, uh, staffing, budget, uh, all those things, we're still going to use that same list. I think that's a, a good uh, mechanism to use uh, when we um, look at new recommendations. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I make a motion to accept the report. Second. Great. Thank you, Council Member. I'll also, as just a brief aside, I just want to welcome the uh, Girl Scout Brownie Troop 60105 from Los Alamitos Elementary. Thank you for your interest in civic engagement and welcome. I know you're getting on with your tour, but just thought I'd give you a quick shout out. Okay, so, and you've made it for an important item. We're on to, we have a motion and a second. We're on to Council Member Ortiz. One more time, there we go. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I appreciate the great work being done to build stronger public safety capacity for our city based on community engagement and trust, both within the San Jose Police Department uh, under the leadership of Chief Mata uh, and the broader city ad administration. Uh, I'm ex especially excited to follow the progress of the three items being put forth uh, by the city manager's office uh, and heartened to see the real coalition uh, tapped as an ongoing partner in these discussions. Um, I, tr I truly believe, and I, I think the majority of the, I think all of our, our council members believe that the m vast majority of our officers do an excellent job in the field and, and truly are uh, heroes to our everyday residents. And for that, I, I really thank them for, for their, their service. That being said, uh, I do have uh, just a few follow-up questions. It's good to see a variety of trainings uh, either completed or in the process of being uh, completed for our police officers. I wanted to ask if any of these, the content of these trainings are publicly available or if there's opportunity for community review. Yes, they are all, all available. Uh, we post them on our, our uh, intranet site and we make them available for anybody that, that requests them on any kind of uh, request, PRA request. That's wonderful, Th thank you for that answer. Um, can we get further explanation on what the language access plan looks like on the ground, such as what services um, are those uh, are being offered to those with limited English proficiency in the community? Yes, uh, thanks for your question, council member. Primarily what it is, it's a service that we use that we've contracted to uh, access a translator immediately if, if needed. Um, it also uh, outlines the procedures that we would use if we are talking to someone that is not proficient in English. It starts with getting an, an officer there who is certified as bilingual in that language. And then if, if that uh, is not available or if that's not working, 
then we have the contract with the company that we, we have somebody on the phone speak to them. So that way we make sure that we're not fumbling through it. We don't have somebody that speaks a little bit of that language. If, if, there's, uh, if there's any kind of language barrier at all, then we go right to the source. We go to somebody who's an expert in speaking that language so that we make sure that they're taken care of. And we have a, a list of, we also have um, some publications that we can provide in, in lots of different languages so we can make sure that they get all the services and all the benefits that, that anyone else would get. I, I really appreciate that because um, we know there's various different languages that are spoken throughout the city. Uh, oh, did you want to speak, Chief? Yes, uh, Councilmember, thank you again for the question. Just to add to what uh, Lieutenant Hamlin said is, um, you know, we have uh, officers that speak over uh, 15 different languages. So again, our goal is to have an officer respond uh, to that language uh, uh, that is needed. And if, if it's not available, then uh, we'll reach out to uh, use that resource. In addition, we've um, um, ensured that our vital documents uh, that are needed are also in, uh, in a language uh, that uh, is needed uh, for our community, uh, along with, um, with the website. Uh, we've partnered uh, with the city manager's office and their language access team right, to look at our documents as well to, make, to ensure that um, uh, the members of our community have accessibility uh, to the resources that we have. Great, I, I appreciate that. Uh, just it's really important given uh, the diversity that we have in the multiple languages. And I'm sure that in some situations, some interactions with law enforcement can already be tense. And just to think if you don't understand what the officer's saying and you can't respond to um, you know, their, um, their orders, then it could even escalate from there. So I really appreciate that. Um, and then third, uh, we've heard some concern from community advocates on how the city has adopted the RIPS committee recommendations number 10 and 20, especially uh, with regards to the lack of community-driven oversight. That's, that's what we're hearing, that's not my, my words. Um, I wanted to ask, is there a way we can bring community input into the procurement process for the We Keep Us Safe vendor? And can we introduce some sort of community advisory component to the goal setting process for the Campaign Zero Goals and the Mayor's Gang Prevention Work Plan? Yes, thank you, Council Member. Um, I've had the, the opportunity to speak with um, members of the Real Coalition about this topic, so I can share some thoughts with you. Uh, I think the, the police departments and the city manager's approach to this list has been really to lean forward. You know, there are a lot of recommendations, so we've been, um, you know, we've really made an effort to find ways to advance as many as possible as efficiently as possible. And sometimes that involved finding alignments between recommendations that the RIPS committee has made in existing city efforts. And sometimes, as with the uh, community outreach plan that the police department is advancing, it's collecting multiple recommendations into one larger project. Uh, and I think what happened in the two that, um, uh, that you mentioned are, uh, in one of them, the, the We Keep Us Safe campaign, it was collected in to uh, the community outreach plan mm -hmm. as part of this larger project. Uh, when, and on consideration, members of the Real Coalition think that it probably doesn't belong there. And their, um, uh, their um, you know, their, it, it doesn't, for, to have the police department leading that effort doesn't meet their intent. Oh, I see. Um, so I think what I have, um, what I've discussed with members of the Real Coalition I think it might be useful for us to all have a meeting to go through comprehensively all of the recommendations from the RIPS committee and make sure that in our, you know, leaning forward, trying to get as many of them done as possible, we're not, um, we're still staying true to their original intent. So, you know, I've offered that to them and hope that, you know, in the next month or so we can all sit down, go through these and make sure that they, they uh, the status is aligned with what, what their intent is. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, thank you for uh, your willingness to lean in and bring community voices into the overall process and you know looking over the documents that were provided in the memo I really appreciate the work that you're doing and um, look forward to um, uh, the ongoing efforts uh, in the police department thank you thank you council member Councilmember Torres testing there you go okay these mics are 
Uh, so f first off, thank you, uh, Chief Mata and Lieutenant Hamlin. Did I say that right, Hamlin? Yes, sir, you oh, did. Oh, good, okay. Uh, and uh, Peter for this pres presentation. Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions. The one, uh, actually, before the question, I, I just want to say thank you so much for, for, for making sure that we continue to be committed on building a community engagement component to this. So that's uh, it's very important, right, especially after um, the George Floyd protest. So I have a question on the LGBTQ awareness. What is, what type of training that do they get? What, what's, what's, what's it really like? I wanna just dig a little bit deeper into it. Thank you for your question, council member. It was a, a four hour block. Um, and uh, like I said, every single member of the department, both sworn and non-sworn, uh, received the training we actually had members from each different division, whether if, if it was uh, a civilian division like uh, communications or records, we had people from their division uh, receive training to train it, so train the trainer and then they did the training. Uh, it took several months for us to complete it and the what the training entailed was, first of all, a lot of history going back uh, to a time where, you know, before 1969. And uh, we actually uh, talk about a, a man named Alan Turing who was a pretty, pretty, pretty well-known person from, uh, from Great Britain who was very instrumental in ending World War II. And uh, he was a member of the community and he was persecuted for it. He was actually arrested and uh, prosecuted and we, we use different examples like that. And basically we just, we use a timeline of, of what that community has had to go through. And then we, we talked uh, a lot about policy, uh, a lot of the changes that we've made uh, regarding policy in particular to transgender individuals, regarding searches and asking them questions about where they are, uh, what, you know, what, what gender they are and things like that. Um, and then uh, we, at the end, what we did was we, we talked, uh, we had a video where um, we had, uh, I think it was five, possibly six members of our department from, again, different bureaus within the department talking about coming out. And this was, I think, very valuable because I think a, a lot of, uh, of our officers are not aware of that process and how personal it can be and, uh, and how frightening it can be. And we actually had, uh, these, these members of our department sharing their experiences. It was about a 20 minute long video. Uh, several of the, the people that participated were sworn officers. And I think it was uh, kind of a surprise to, to some members of the department that they were uh, talking about that. But I think it was, it was incredibly helpful and I think it uh, really was, was very effective. Great, no, thank you. Uh, that's uh, extremely important. I know I've, I've talked to various uh, trans activists uh, who continue to say that we are getting better when it comes to dealing with our trans community, so that's, uh, that's uh, really important. Uh, I, I wanna touch a little bit on the community response to domestic violence. Uh, I think I've piss fizz, you've heard my comments that, that uh, incidents of domestic violence in the LGBTQ community go unreported or underreported um, because uh, a folks status, right? Um, some folks might not be out. So we just gotta make sure uh, that either, j just like my colleague, uh, Councilman Ortiz mentioned, we get an organization that knows how to deal with, with, with uh, domestic violence in our LGBTQ plus uh, community. Cause that, that's, a, that's a, a great concern, right? Um, when, I, when we look at the numbers, right? it's underreported or not reported at all, right? So I think that's uh, important to keep an eye on. So uh, the other one is we've been going to a lot of community meetings and folks do not know about MCAT. They think it's an entirely different number or that they only work nine to five. Uh, and I know, Lieutenant, you just mentioned that, that it's uh, seven days a week. Um, and 
we've heard differently. So if you can just clear that on, on record real quick. So MCAT is all is 24 seven or is there certain shifts Thank or time your, periods? Sorry, thanks for your question. It's, it's not all shifts. It's uh, primarily day and evening hours. And uh, we, we just, we simply don't have the, the staffing for that. And, and keep in mind that the officers that participate in MCAT are specially trained. So uh, all of our officers receive what's called uh, CIT, which is a, a 40 hour training. These officers that are in MCAT, that's a, a much more in depth, much more extensive training that they receive. And so there's only a limited number of those officers that, that can do it. So if there is a feeling that maybe there's not full coverage around the clock or maybe even every calendar day of the year, it, it's probably due to some attrition occasionally and also could be due to illness or you know people not being available a certain day. But we, we try, I think we strive very hard to make sure we have a team out there uh, during the day and during the evening. Uh, I don't think we're able to, to cover the entire 24-hour period of a day, but we do as, as well as we can with the resources we have. Okay. And so when a resident calls 911 and it's not uh, a, a call for a crime, but a call for a mental health uh, incident happening in their block, their neighborhood, their business, when they call 911, all they have to ask or say that they prefer that MCAT comes to that to that call? Again, thank you for your question. No, they don't have to say that. That's something that's determined uh, at dispatch and uh, is, is then determined in the field. If, um, if a dispatcher recognizes this is a possible call that uh, the, the MCAT should be aware of and that they should respond to, then they will do that. And then once it, uh, once it reaches the field that a, uh, if uh, there's a sergeant that's aware of the call that would review the call and look at it and say, you know, this is a call that would be appropriate for, for MCAT, then they would do that. Um, obviously, if somebody requests MCAT, if they know what it is, then, then that's obviously something that we would look into. But we, we definitely screen all the calls for possible MCAT calls. Okay, great. Um, and, and Council Member, just, yeah. just to add uh, yeah. to what uh, Lieutenant Hamlin's saying, is because it's only a limited number of officers, right, that could be tied up on a call. So that means if the, M if the MCAT officers are tied up on a call, then normal officers will respond. Much like uh, when we get calls from 988, right, uh, someone from the community will call 988, then they'll call us. Um, and then we determine, again, uh, wh whoever's available. And if MCAT's available, Again, those calls are prioritized just like um, any other call, but um, it is a resource. Um, you know, as our staffing um, grows, that's uh, one of the uh, units that we would like to grow as well. Great, thank you, Chief and, and Lieutenant. If, and if I could just add one more thing, yep. that the, um, our coverage is 10 o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the evening, to answer your earlier question. Great, so 10 to eight, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Correct. All right, great, thank you, appreciate it. Great, thank you, Council Member. Council Member Jimenez? Jeez. Sorry, I'm still trying to figure this out. <laughs> uh, uh, first, I just want to say thank you for the report. This is the second time I've heard it. Uh, I know Public Safety Committee, just so you all know, this wasn't actually due to come before the full council, but we cross-referenced it because we thought it was an important enough topic to have you all sort of listen to the same presentation and chime in. Um, so I just wanted to express that to all my colleagues on the Public Safety Committee. Uh, the first question I had is related to something I read recently. It's, it's in the, it was an uh, article in San Jose Spotlight. It says, police advocates say San Jose is watering down reforms. And I was wondering if Chief or Peter or anyone up there <laughs> wants a comment or just express some thoughts on, on, on that article. Yeah, I think this is the, 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 the same um, topic as I... Uh, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, I think the the issue here is, you know, as I said, the, both the police department and the city manager's office have been very proactive in attempting to find ways to advance as many of these recommendations as possible. Um, uh, in a few cases, uh, the the way that we're advancing them is the the real coalition is expressed. It's not consistent with the original intent of the reimagining commission. 
So I think we a- approach this in good faith. We, um, you know, we, we want to move them forward, but if our proposal for moving them forward is not consistent with the original intent of the committee, then we are happy to adjust the status and, um, you know, uh, move it from in progress to um, some other designation to more accurately reflect the, the intent of the committee. So what I've suggested to the Real Coalition is that we sit down uh, and have a, a working session where we go through all of their recommendations and um, you know talk them through and any of them that they uh, don't believe align with their original intent, we are happy to change. So it's, I, don't, I don't think we have any, any objection to doing that work and bringing them in as, as partners in that. Thank you, and Chief, before I go to you, just Peter, do you have a sense as to when, I imagine you're already maybe conducting some of that outreach, or when do you think that's gonna take place? Uh, yeah, hope it's gonna I take have, place? I've, we've been meeting with, uh, the, we've met with them twice since the last committee meeting. Okay. Those meetings, we, we did discuss this, but we were also discussing the timelines that we, part of the, the purpose of our last meeting was to talk through those timelines so that we could have, you know, vet those out before we present them to you. Um, so I think we, I've, you know, let them know I'm available to, to, to schedule a time whenever it works for their members to, um, to meet with them. So it's, it's really whenever it works for them, we're happy to work through that. All right. Thank you. And then Chief, you wanted to? This council member, uh, I was just going to add, um, and Peter mentioned it already, and in the initial meetings uh, that um, I was part of, we provided all 536 recommendations, um, so to be fully transparent as to what we're working on and what we're not working on. So uh, all those recommendations are available, or were available months ago, and uh, they still are available now. So um, look forward to um, their uh, review of those uh, recommendations and the meetings that the city manager is having. Okay, thank you. And then just uh, just uh, for, for those of you that, sure, you're not all watching Public Safety Committee, but when this item came before us, uh, Siobhan Neary was still the independent police auditor and she was actually in the audience so we called her up to give her thoughts about some of this and so she mentioned something there and I just wanted to touch base again to just to get a sense of where things are uh, she had mentioned something about the I think it's uh, if you look at the attachment it's number 73 it's the early intervention policy is a program I think it is essentially to identify officers that may be you know have repeated behavior and things of that nature so so to catch that early and I know that we've seen that in closed session and just having discussions about things like that. Um, but um, I think during the, when was the last PISFIS when you guys were there? Was it May 18th? Yeah, it was May 18th. It feel, feels like so long ago. Um, you had mentioned that uh, you were, a vendor had been, or I'm not sure if a vendor had been chosen, but can you tell us what the current status is? I'm curious how that's moving along. It is moving along. I think we are we haven't finalized with a vendor as of yet, but where I think we're making progress is we're also putting together a team within the department, uh, several different layers, um, people from different bureaus to also be involved in that process. And I think we're, we've pretty much finalized the, the team that we're going to be using that's going to be selecting the vendor uh, going forward. Um, once we get the the vendor selected, um, you know it's 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 just a very high tech um, product, and uh, it's going to be something that I think is going to be very useful. Do you have a sense as to when that's going to happen? Uh, and the reason I'm sort of touching on this is that she highlighted that as a, as a very important thing, right? And I I'd like to think we most of us, if not all of us, agree on that. And so, do you have a sense as to when you're going to land the plane on that? And when? Yeah, the uh, the person that's in charge of it, I spoke to him uh, just a few weeks ago, and he believes that it will be um, by the end of the year. Okay, all right. And, and not to put you on the spot, but I think when we talked about it on May 15th or May 18th, I think the answer was exactly the same, which is cool. It may be sort of where you may be in that space, but I would hate for this to get bogged down, and so <laughs> I'd like to to think that there's going to be more you know progress. I know these are big things that we're doing. Yeah, thank you for your question, uh, Councilman. It's something we're very committed to, um, and the, the people that we've chosen to choose the vendor are very committed to it. They're some of our sharpest people with a lot of experience. One of them is actually a member of my staff, and she she deals with, she's a senior analyst who deals with um, all of our Public Records Act requests, dealing with uh, SB 1421 and, uh, and SB 16. And so we're just, we've selected the right people. We're very committed to it. We're going to make sure it happens. 
Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the other thing that was pointed out by the IPA and it was surprising to me, and, and I don't recall exactly what the response was, but it was something along the lines of that, you know, there's, there's like 536 something recommendations. The oldest one on there is from 1994, <laughs> which is it's just mind boggling to me. And I'm trying to understand one is, is, is that the oldest recommendation in this list in this 536? Um, I believe it is. There, okay. there were actually, um, yeah, no, I believe that is the, the okay. most, uh, the oldest one. All right. And, the, and then so the other question I have is that's the oldest one. Obviously, some of this, some of this, the large portions of this work came along long after 1994, obviously. How, how are we deciding or how is the department deciding what to put on that list, right? Because it seemed, it's just overwhelming. There's just a lot there, right? And I'm trying to ascertain sort of what the, the reasoning for keeping these old, super old recommendations on there uh, and how it sort of relates to the more current work, say, within the last five years since the, you know, the uh, protests and things like that. Sure, Council Member. Again, uh, this is why we implemented that process, the priority determination, right? Uh, the interconnectivity, right? Uh, does it align with current policies and practices? Um, you know, are there any legal constraints? Do we have the staffing to, to do this? Uh, do we have the budget, uh, the workload capacity, the, uh, all, all those uh, seven things that I mentioned? That's also what we looked at. Um, so I don't know if that 94 one is part of the 57 that we're not gonna do, but we can take a look at where, yeah. where, where that stands. But that's the lens that we used uh, for each one of these recommendations. Yeah, okay. I, how, how, maybe another question I should ask or ask it a different way is, how do we determine what gets on this list of 536, if you will? I mean, what if there's something that comes from a conversation we're having here and we say, hey, we should really look at this. Does that get added to the 536? Like, how, how, do, you, how do you determine what you put on there? Currently, yes, that's what we do. Okay. Um, again, as part of our continuous improvement and innovation that we're doing here at the department, um, we'll take the input. Uh, and again, if it falls within our goals uh, and this priority determination, then that's something that, that we'll put on. If it doesn't, then uh, probably won't make it. Okay, and then just the, about the attachment, uh, I was trying to remember, I think during the Public Safety Committee, at least for me, and I'd love to hear what my colleagues think, but um, if you look at the top uh, line uh, of the attachments of the tables, it's number, source, identifier, description, priority type, status, hyperlink. Um, I think it'd be helpful to know sort of when those came in, were plugged into the to the list, if you will. Like, for example, if number one's been sitting around for tw you know 10, 15 years, right? Uh, I think that'll give us a better sense as to well w what's happening with that one, right? And because currently, right now, on the identifiers, sometimes like number one, for example, says 15 PP9. I don't know. I don't know what that means exactly. Some other ones seem to have dates, and I'm trying. I, I think, and and so I'm trying. I think it'd be helpful just to have something on there that helps us identify. Some yeah, we can put together a data dictionary, uh, so we can describe better describe um, the identifiers. Yeah, that'd be helpful. And then the other question I had about the attachment is, I notice if you, you know, I'm on page one of the attachments, right? You could just scroll through. I think, as far as I could scroll, all the updates. So the status, most of them say five four twenty three. Can, can you help me understand sort of where that date comes from as it relates to, it, it seems to me to me be a, a date that's in which this was updated, if you will? Or? Yes, thanks for your question, and that's exactly right. So it was in preparation for our, um, our PISFIS presentation in May. We wanted to make sure that we had, going into that presentation, that we had the most up-to-date numbers and uh, updates. Okay. Um. All right, and then. Um, and if I may. Yes, uh, please. I, I should have added that, that that was a pretty expensive process because we didn't just arbitrarily update it. We actually reached out to all of the, the people who were managing those items and asked for an update. I appreciate that. Yeah. that, that you, you read my mind as to where, where I was, because I was wondering, well, do we just put 5-4 on all of them? But if you scroll through more, there's different dates. So I, just for full transparency, there is different dates. So. Yes, and we actually updated it again um, a few weeks ago. Okay. There, there weren't a lot of changes, but there were a few. All right, all right, good to know. Um, okay, those are all my comments. I, I just, uh, obviously, uh, this topic, 
everything you're working on is of, of deep community interest. I think we hear about it consistently. I do. Um, and so, you know, I, I hope we continue marching down the road and solving all, well, moving a lot of these forward and, and really bringing some more clarity and transparency and accountability uh, to, to, to the department. And uh, so I thank you for all the work. I know it's not easy to sit up here and hear or read stuff in the media, whatever it may be, but I, I appreciate your efforts to try to address all this. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Good questions. Council, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, I also would like to thank you. And, you know, I know that um, <laughs> there's been a lot, a lot of work um, that has gone into it. So I want to thank the police department, Chief Mata. Um, and, uh, and the city manager's office for really, really rolling up your sleeves. And uh, I know when I came on board uh, in January, I thought, oh my gosh, what does this mean? And uh, the staff has been really, really great in you know, grounding me in, in all the work that, um, that you have been doing. So uh, I commend you for that because you've gone through a lot and, and trying to really figure out what is uh, um, good for our community, so I, I thank you for that. Uh, and I do know that it takes time to uh, get through these, to build that trust, and, and to do everything. Uh, I feel like a lot of progress has been made, and I know that, you know, Chief Mata, you've talked a lot about continuous improvement. I know the city manager also is into the customer service, community improve. I mean, uh, have a customer improvement. Uh, so it's something that, at the end of the day, it's gonna be good for our community. Um, I looked at your project timelines, and I know that um, there's a lot that's going to be done, and uh, I think that's great. They're on my priority list, so uh, certainly it's something that I, I watch carefully. I will say that the uh, community-based solutions to domestic violence is really, like, I found it a little bit too long <laughs> in terms of how, and I know that RFPs take a while and all of that, but, you know, I would encourage you, if it's possible, if, you're, if you can shave a month off or two or whatever it is, because the sooner you get this on board, I think that you can start um, getting some analytics, try to get some information on other ways in which we can handle um, uh, domestic violence issues and have a partner uh, through this RFP that will assist in that. So the sooner, the better. So I'm just gonna encourage you, I know that it's not going to happen instantaneously, but if you can shave off a little bit of time on there, I think that it would be able to serve the community sooner, and I think that it will benefit all of us. So that's the only thing that I kind of like am pushing, because I think that the benefits are really high. So uh, again, I want to thank the department and the city manager's office for all the work, and I know that we'll continue to hear from you at our PISFIS committee. Thanks. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Uh, Councilor Dwan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Lieutenant. I'm very proud to say that I I see that your improvement from, from 539 suggestions, you did 267. Do you have a timeline to complete the the rest of the requirements or suggestion? You mean uh, to get through the entire list? Yes. No, there's no set time uh, limit. We, this is still fairly new. The list isn't really that old. And uh, I think we're kind of seeing just now really how long some of these items are taking. Obviously some are, are going faster than others, but I think we're getting uh, a good sense now for how long it's taking us to complete items that we're addressing and then to begin to address items that we haven't been addressing. Um, so it feels like, you know, right now we're at 50% and we've been doing this for, it's, uh, the list is about two years old. It feels like we're probably about halfway there. Well, I know that you continue to be effectively and efficiently trying to resolve some of these recommendation. Now, on the other hand, what do you need from our council in order to complete the rest of it in, in a, you know, the next couple years or 
whatever the amount of time uh, it takes. Thank you for the question. Um, all I ask is uh, the mayor and council of patience uh, because it is a lot of uh, work that uh, our folks are doing and we know that if there's an issue, an important issue that's uh, it's a priority, we are gonna jump on that, right, and work on that to ensure that uh, we provide the best service or if the community is affected in some way to fix that, to repair that. So it's not to say that these are the only things that we're working on. There's constant things that are coming up that we will address, uh, and if they're a priority, we are going to address them. But uh, all I ask is um, patience, and you know, we have the, uh, the, t uh, the reporting outs, and uh, each one, I expect each one to uh, move, move that needle. So that's um, my thoughts on that. I know that your department is working on both how to treat different culture, languages, uh, from and to include our um, LBGTQ plus community. Uh, and I would say that I feel that, yes, there's always room for improvement, but I think we, um, as a city as a whole, especially the police department, is, is leading the West Coast. Um, um, in that area, and also, are we closer to the top 10 safest city in the nation at this point? Not that I know of. Um, I haven't seen us on a on a list anytime soon. I know that used to be, um, there used to be a publication when I was a, a pretty new officer that had us listed at number one. I, I don't think that publication puts out that list anymore. And uh, I know there are several that, that do um, periodically put out lists of, of safest cities, but uh, I, not that I know of, the, are we in the top 10? And uh, Councilman, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, and I think maybe the reason why they switched that reporting is we just switched over to NIBRS, as you probably may have heard uh, in our PIS FIS report, where before it was the Uniform Crime Report and I may need some help with uh, what diverge me. I think it's national incident uh, based reporting system. Uh, so they're categorizing uh, the, the type of incidents differently. So you're, you're gonna see uh, different reportings uh, for that. But uh, what I can say is the last two years, right, our, our homicides, uh, our homicide unit has had a 100% solve rate. So. I mean, that says a lot about the, the men and women that, that are out there, and we solved uh, plenty of major cases. So whatever those numbers are, uh, I would put our men and women against any department. Yeah, I don't think any other department can beat uh, that number. I believe from 2019 until now, isn't our crime rate has gone down? Am I correct on that? Again, uh, because of the change in numbers, the latest numbers that I've seen in, uh, I think, uh, October, uh, I mean, April, I'm sorry, before we switched over, um, the numbers haven't uh, gone down. We've uh, had a little uptick in, um, in violent crime and a small decrease in, in property crime. I don't have the exact numbers, but I think uh, we have some numbers posted online up to April. Thank you. And if I'm correct, if you put the numbers together from year to year, at certain point of time, like in summertime, the uptick, but then it also goes down toward the winter time. Am I correct on that? Yes, yeah, certain certain crimes do. Um, it also uh, has to do with uh, summer when. Uh, when kids are out of school, certain crimes go up. Uh, we know that, I think we talked about in Episphus a, a few months ago, that uh, uh, ve vehicle theft actually goes up in the winter because of uh, people warming up their cars and going inside. So it, it kind of depends on the actual crime. Well, th um, I just want to end this. I just want to say thank you to all the police officers out there um, working hard to keep our city safe. You guys are doing a great job. and. Um, I'm grateful for having a department like this. Thank you.
Great. Thank you, Council Member. I think that exhausts the hands. I'll just add my thanks to the department, and I've had the opportunity to witness the close collaboration between City Manager's Office and the department on this very large body of work. You all have obviously received quite an array of recommendations from different sources, and I think done a very commendable job of organizing them and reporting out regularly and very, very clearly about your prioritization, your progress. As you know from my March budget message, I, I'm very interested in those items that you uh, have prioritized around community-based solutions to domestic violence, 911 call differentiation, figuring out how we can be more effective in deploying the right resource to the right call, as, as uh, I know other council members highlighted. Uh, violence prevention and, and community engagement, all really, really important things for us to continue to learn how to do better. But I just, I appreciate all the work the department's doing to continually learn and grow and improve how we operate. And uh, want to thank um, Councilor Jimenez, who's the PISFISH chair for referring to this to the full council for our edification. Um, so thank you again. And with that, Tony, let's vote. motion passes unanimously great thank you okay we're on to item 8.1 last agendized item for the day this is the housing catalyst team work plan status report there's a short staff presentation Thanks, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Jared Ferguson, uh, Principal Planner with the Department of Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. I'll be uh, doing the presentation with Kristen Clements, uh, Acting Deputy Director of the Housing Department. Uh, we're here today to talk to you about the Housing Catalyst Team work plan. So first, a, a bit of background. In 2018, staff proposed the first iteration of the Housing Crisis Work Plan. The work plan proposed strategies and policy actions to help facilitate housing production for both affordable and market rate housing with an overall goal of 25,000 housing units approved under construction or completed by 2023. It was our first effort to clearly communicate to the city council and the public all the work we were doing or intended to do around housing production. As part of the work program from 2018 through 2022, staff provided regular report, status reports to the Community and Economic Development Committee and to the City Council. These reports were an opportunity to provide updates on individual work items, add new work items, and report on housing production. As part of this work plan and to better coordinate across multiple departments in the city, we also created the Housing Catalyst Team. This team is composed of key senior staff from the Housing Department, Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement, the Office of Economic Development, and Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services that are all involved with implementing the work and meet regularly on a bi-monthly basis. In November of 2022, staff provided the council with the final update on the housing crisis work plan. Understanding that we had more work to do to address our housing, the city's housing goals, we wanted to continue the model we had established in the housing crisis work plan. The exercise of compiling a unified work plan related to housing has been useful to help organize and align our work across multiple departments. The development of the city's updated housing element provided us with an opportunity to transition to a new model and work program, and staff recommended development of a new Housing Catalyst Team work plan at the November 2022 City Council meeting. Incomplete and ongoing work items from the previous housing crisis work plan were incorporated into the development of our housing element. 
On June 20th, the City Council adopted the City's updated housing element, and the following week on June 26th, we presented to the Community Economic Development Committee the first uh, version of the Housing Catalyst Team Work Plan. The committee accepted our report and cross-referenced it to this council meeting. And on August 10th, the Housing and Community Development Commission heard the Housing Catalyst Work Plan at its meeting. The commission discussed several specific work plan items and provided comments that are detailed in the supplemental memo. Overall, the commission expressed general support for the work plan and did not take any formal action. The first version of our Housing Catalyst Team Work Plan is composed of a subset of the over 130 programs proposed in the city's housing element. With the Housing Catalyst Team Work Plan, our goal is to identify near-term work that is currently underway or that we intend to initiate in the next two years. Other housing-related work items from staff or from the City Council can be added at any time and could be work not included in the housing element, but work that is found to be important to furthering our housing goals. The latest version of the work plan is contained in attachment A to the supplemental memo. It's divided into two sections with the first being work underway and the second being work to be initiated. The closer alignment with the housing element has also given us the opportunity to expand the previous housing crisis work plan was primarily focused on housing production, but with this new work plan, we are capturing more fully all of our housing policy work relating not just to production, but also policy work related to preservation and protection. So since the CED hearing in June, the Housing Catalyst team has worked to define measurements that are assigned to each work item. The measurements are defined in greater detail in attachment B of the supplemental memo and the work plan contained in attachment A of the supplemental now includes a column for each measurement. Impact is the measure of the effect staff estimates a particular work item will have when it is completed. For example, in items related to production, impact is measured in the number of units produced or if time or cost savings is anticipated to be achieved. So for high impact, um, High impact is expected to enable production of over 100 units annually, whereas a moderate impact item is anticipated to produce annually 50 to 100 units. There are also definitions of impact as it relates to protection and preservation. Effort is the estimated time required to complete a work item. High effort, high effort is a multi-year effort, uh, whereas moderate is estimated not to exceed 12 months. In the current version of the work plan, the work items are not strictly prioritized based on these measurements, but they're intended to provide context to the public and council. Moving forward, these measurements will be used by, this, by staff as we evaluate initiating uh, work in the future. And I'll pass it to Kristen to highlight some of the work plan items. Thank you, Jared. On this slide are a few selected items from the work plan uh, that staff is now working hard to advance. The dates that are listed are an estimate of when staff expects to bring these items before council if that is scheduled in the work plan. Uh, again, we're looking at the supplemental memo. That work plan supersedes the one attached to the Community and Economic Development Committee memo. Uh, with the cost of development, which is work plan item eight, an ongoing work item, of course, is to update our cost of development every two to three years to assess the feasibility of market rate, housing, and affordable housing in current economic conditions. We currently have a study session scheduled for October 23rd on this. For mobile home parks, work plan item 18. This item, of course, is to apply the mobile home park general, land, general plan land use designation to all existing mobile home parks in the city. 13 parks that were determined to be the highest priority will be coming to a council hearing in November, and the remainder will be coming to the council in the spring. The soft story program, which is work plan item 11, this work is being jointly brought forward by the building division, the Office of Emergency Management, and the Housing Department. The item that will come to council by the end of this year is the draft mandatory retrofit program which includes a rebate or incentive program to help owners offset the cost of the work. 
and streamline processes for buildings that are subject to the apartment rent ordinance. The North San Jose Affordable Housing Zoning Overlays is work plan item 13. These new overlays were included as part of the housing element, and they're intended to permit both 100% affordable housing and mixed income developments on sites in North San Jose that previously did not allow for housing. Staff anticipates this coming to council in early December for adoption, and we're doing outreach this fall on that. The next item on preservation and community development capacity building, that's work plan item 26. This work is to issue a notice of funding availability for capacity building grants for nonprofits who want to get more knowledgeable about acquiring and rehabilitating properties. These funds are from the community benefit funds from Google. And note that this item will be moved up to the next, to the first chart in the next iteration of the work plan because we have been working on this and we expect to issue the NOFA in September. Finally, the Housing Department is working to create a preservation notice of funding availability and underwriting guidelines to be issued before the end of the calendar year. And then we anticipate awards from that NOFA process could come to council as early as February. Next slide. Thank you. At the Community and Economic Development Committee meeting for the Housing Catalyst Work Plan in June, uh, there was a request that staff continue to provide updated housing data around production to the extent that we come in front of you. So we're including this slide for some context. As we move into our more re regular reporting rhythm, we do intend to provide more data as a component of these reports, especially as it relates directly to the housing element. This chart shows the number of units that it received building permits by calendar year. This stage in the process, of course, generally links to and reflects when construction begins. So you can see that in the first half of 2023, we have seen a decent number of new housing units pulling permits as compared to the last three years. Of the 1,477 units that had permits pulled, 61% of them were market rate and 39% were restricted affordable. In addition, for affordable housing, the city currently has 1,900 units in the pipeline across 18 developments. The figures in this bar chart do include the 1,138 affordable homes that are currently under construction in 11 developments, and they may have had permits pulled in 2023, 2022, or even 2021. And there are an additional seven deals with 763 units that are in the pipeline. Three developments have already gotten city funding commitments, and they're assembling their other sources of financing before they can go ahead and start construction. And another four deals have qualified through the housing department's notice of funding availability, and they are achieving the city's readiness requirements before they get brought to the council for funding commitments as well. Since 2020, the production for market rate housing has primarily been composed of one or two larger multifamily projects per year and ADU units. And I, you've heard this before and you'll hear some more shortly that increased construction costs paired with rising interest rates have made new development challenging and that continues to be true. Um, and the affordable housing that has been supported in the last few years is generally by uh, relatively new sources such as Measure E and the county's Measure A funds which were approved in 2016 but are pretty much now exhausted for San Jose. Finally, here are the next steps on this report and the work under it. Um, right now staff is awaiting response from the State Department of Housing and Community Development about the housing element uh, it was submitted at the end of June to the state, shortly after the council certified the element. And we're waiting to hear back at the 60-day mark um, at the end of August, so around August 28th, as to whether they accept it. Staff is working hard on the several items I just mentioned on the previous slide, so those are being advanced. And among those items are advancing two upcoming city council study sessions on housing. 
The first one on September 7th is going to give an overview of all housing programs um, in all three, three P areas, we call them the three Ps, production, preservation, and protection. And that includes some basic information on the affordable housing development process. This study session was in response to council's request and council member Batra's request and suggestion in March uh, when the Almaden affordable housing development was brought to council. The intent of this study session is to give background and context to the work that housing does and provide more preparation for the cost of development study session. The cost of development study session, which will cover both market rate and affordable, is scheduled for October um, 26th. Moving forward, staff will be bringing the housing catalyst work plan status updates in synchrony with the housing element annual performance report. That state report is due every March and so we're going to be updating the near-term work and our progress there and formalizing the state report together every year. This is the most efficient process as the items are basically identical between the two and, um, and this will give more time for staff to actually do the work and um, come up with good uh, measures of how the progress is going. The annual reports will come first to the Housing and Community Development Commission we're anticipating February 2024. Then it will go to Housing and Economic Development Committee, also in February, and City Council in March. And with that, I think we are open to any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you for the report. Let's go to public comment. Blair followed by Brian. Blair, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Okay, I'm going to move on to Brian, followed by Paul. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, click click no on that. that. I, I accidentally gave you something. Oh, okay, just click, click no. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry. I, really need, I just want to make sure when you do, plus thank you for all the hard work you did. That was good. But, oh uh, gosh, um, Bascom and Moor Park, those home, well, they were homes, um, you know, they're going to be annexed. Eventually, when you do build whatever you do, can you make that area safer? If you're riding a bike in there, you take your life in your hands, you really do. Or if you're walking, goodness forgive you. Um, and it's hard for the Bascom turn and all that. I'm just saying, please keep that in mind when you do this. I'm sure you will, I'm just laying it out now. Thank you. Paul, followed by Colin User One. Uh, yes, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. The housing department's policies have been a failure. That isn't a critique, that's, that's simply just a statement of fact. Because of those failures, people are literally dying on our streets because of one particular policy. I don't care to hear all the rhetoric because the rhetoric is garbage. It's just language that's used to convolute what the real issue is. Here's the real issue. From 2016 till now, 95% to 150% of market rate housing goals have been met year after year, quarter after quarter, successfully. That is congratulations to the housing department. They have been successful in that endeavor. So I congratulate them on that. At least they did that right. However, there's a consequence to that. In the exact same time period, the threshold of ELI, VLI, everybody else, all the poor, which I'm included in that, the threshold for that housing production has never broken 25% ever. Now you're from 2016 till now, you are not going to get that kind of statistical fact unless it is by design. That doesn't happen by accident. Because it's happened by design, and here's why it's happened by design. This city continues to fail to acknowledge the redlining policies and the generational impacts of those redlining policies. Now, the people that you are accountable for 
You don't want to produce housing for them. Why? Because you don't want them here. You want them out of here. You're trying to gentrify a particular population out of here. And that population is the descendants of the cannery workers, the descendants of the people that built this city. You need to check yourselves. We need to start putting that on the table. We need to discuss the historical. Call in user one, followed by Blair. Yeah, yeah this mic. Yeah, hi, Martha O'Connell, Golden State Manufactured Homeowners League, representing Mobile Home Park residents. Got three huge thank yous today. Kristen, thank you so much. I'm so proud of you for putting in the highlights in the slide, the Mobile Home Park General Plan designation. I've written letters before saying housing sits there and never says those words, and the residents are upset. Well, we're not upset today. We thank you very much. Kristen, great work. Also, a huge thank you to the planning department who sent me the flyer, the postcard that is going out to the park residents, those are who are going to be among the first 13. It was a fabulous flyer. It is easily understandable. I couldn't have written it better myself, and in fact, I'm reproducing it in my newsletter. So thank you very, very much to planning. And the third and final thank you is to Councilperson Pam Foley, who has been the resident champion and has been bringing up this issue for years. Thank you, Kristen Planning and Councilperson Foley. Blair followed by Mike. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Thank you, Tony, for uh, coming back to myself. I, I found a new device to use. My previous device didn't work. Thank you. Um, to try to continue uh, to offer factual ideas and just my, my thoughts on issues that I, I try to be polite about and, and share like pretty decently and honestly with yourselves that I think can help yourselves with good informational data and, and thought and how to consider issues. Um, for this item, you know, I'm not the most knowledgeable guy in the world, but yet I try to offer some things that uh, can be of help, I think. For this item, uh, Paul Soto has brought out a, a really important point a few months ago that uh, we have been talking about here at Council about uh, the future of the uh, retrofit program and to make sure that uh, when owners start the process of retrofitting that uh, tenants can have a place to stay. And uh, I think we've been working on this issue a lot that, uh, you know, that tenants won't be kicked out. And if they are, if they do have to leave, they can be provided housing in the meantime until, you know, the retrofit is done by the owner. And that's a lot to work out. And I think the city government has been working on that. And thank you. I know uh, Rosalind Huey talked about it at the uh, city council meeting a, a few weeks ago on the subject. Thank you. Good luck in continuing to talk about it and make it an open and clear subject so we're all good <laughs> and we're all doing well uh, with the item that I think we've all wanted it to do well over like a decade now. And uh, now that it's coming to fruition, we're trying to practice it in really good terms, hopefully. What we're not doing well, let's hope we can uh, try to improve upon. Thanks a lot. Mike, followed by Catherine. Preservation, this is Mike Sautter, Preservation Action Council. Just a brief comment. Um, during the entitlement process, it would be really, really good if we can keep the housing that is being uh, proposed for demolition, even if it is to make, you know, more affordable housing um, with people housed. Um, it does a couple of things when we do that. It uh, prevents um, blight because if somebody living in a house is somebody that's going to make sure that blight doesn't occur. And if it does, it gets repaired. Um, but it also, um, it also provides um, a potential source of income for a developer during what is always a long, um, not only entitlement process, but funding process after entitlement. And, um, and it's just the right thing to do. Just uh, would encourage the city to see if there's anything that we can do within our ordinance to make sure that we're not evicting people prior to, um, you know, plan demolition of a project uh, site and, um, and encourage our friends in the development community to think about 
the benefits to them in terms of protecting their prop properties and continuing a revenue stream during a period um, prior to uh, a new bill. Thank you. Catherine. Uh, good afternoon. I'm not really speaking on behalf of Surge right now. This is Catherine Hedges, District 3. Um, I've been around affordable housing advocacy for a while, and I agree with all the previous speakers. And I witnessed a lot of houses that just sit around vacant and are blind and you know, do fall into blight when they're unoccupied. And it just seems like a waste when we have such a shortage of housing. And I'm also concerned that with the saucery retrofit um, process, um, I understand the value of the work. I had lived in the LA broadcast area after you know, at the time of the Northridge quake and so many apartment buildings just pancaked. So I understand that's valuable. What I am concerned about is that um, landlords may decide to use that as an opportunity to do Ellis Act, you know, serious renovation, uh, evictions and just get tenants out of the properties that are currently naturally affordable if they're old enough to need this and then do the, do the sizing retrofit, put in some fancier countertops and then re-rent them at a much higher price that the existing tenants wouldn't be able to afford if they got a right of return. And I hope that the city can find a way to prevent that while getting work done and as Blair suggested, making sure that tenants have adequate temporary housing if the retrofit process makes their apartment unlivable. We need to make sure that tenants are, you know, that we don't just have this wave of evictions from nationally affordable housing as a result. Um, that would be a very horrible unintended consequence of the good work of size and retrofit. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you. Okay, we have a few hands. We'll go to Councillor Batra first. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that comprehensive report and the work plan. Uh, right from the time when I came on the council, I've been working with you in terms of increasing the supply by cutting the time it takes to get the units and as a result, cut the cost down. I'm glad to see that in the work plan, there are items which make the speed of approvals, et cetera, to become uh, a part of our work process, like the watching the SB9 and other items like that. I also, even though it's not part of the work plan, I do want to acknowledge that the recent program which PBCE launched softly, and I'm making a little more noise about it. They launched softly. Uh, the best builder design program, uh, which makes it a lot easier to get approval for certain kind of products or certain kind of enhancements and thereby reduce the amount of work which the planning department will have to do or entitlement department will have to do versus what the architects and structural engineers will take the responsibility for. So thank you very much for launching that softly, and uh, I hope it's going to be extremely successful. In terms of the housing uh, catalyst plan, <coughs> I appreciate that you have come back with the two dates for the study session which we requested, and you're going to comprehensively going to cover the items which are there, okay, uh, which we requested. I do want to make a motion to accept the status report, and I want to request or direct whatever the proper terminology is, that with this extensive work plan, we are not able to communicate to the community all the good stuff you are doing. So what we need and help from you is if you will put on a time scale that every six months or eight months or 12 months, whenever there's going to be an impact of certain number of your work elements program, that this is what the community can touch, feel, see, 
to feel that. Today, I can take these work elements, but I'm not in a position to get you the credit which you deserve from the community for doing all the work. So to make our community feel better and also to get you the acknowledgement back for all the work you do. So my request will be if you will provide whenever, and I'm not saying it needs to be quarterly, tell us if it is going to be something which is going to real, yield results in six months, give us for six months so that we can take it back to the community. The second, so that would be my request to add that in there. The other piece is that when we are engaging a lot of stakeholders from, for different elements, one of the things which I've heard is that at times we may not be picking up all the stakeholders which we should have picked up. So if you will be transparent enough in your either the study session or somewhere else that for these work element, these are the stakeholders we plan to engage and be willing to accept a little bit of an input from the outside that, hey, is this a list comprehensive or would you need to have some other people? I think with those two things, we can have the community feel better about what the work you're doing, plus instead of them saying city doesn't do anything or they don't listen to us, and making the stakeholders more comprehensive uh, confirmed, I think we'll have a better a relationship with the community we are trying to serve. So with those, thank you very much for all what you're doing and good luck with this. You, as you know, I continue to push these things, but you have my tremendous support on the items you are trying to do. So with that, I make a motion to accept the report with those suggestions I gave. Great, thank you, Council Member. We have a second on your motion, Councilor Torres. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, item 18 is is super super important. I think when we think about mobile home parks, it's uh, very important that we preserve our mobile home. So our mobile home. So thank you so much uh, for all the all the work that you've been doing with with that. Um, we there's a long list, but I've only decided to pick three uh, because uh, I know colleagues have other concerns. But uh, the ones that were uh, particularly concerning to me were um, not concerning, but just a few few questions. Is um, item 32 uh, housing and business corridors, and two out of those business districts are in Council District Three, and they're very important with a lot of history, so uh, Luna Park, 13th Street, and Japantown. Uh, the other one, obviously, is in Willow Glen, which is District 6, but I'm sure Councilmember Davis will talk about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, continuously we, you know, we get presented housing projects where it's, um, it's scary that we might lose historical small businesses. So uh, my question, and I wrote it down so I don't forget it. Uh, so how, how are we relating this to AB 2011 and SB 6? Yeah, so um, we're doing that analysis now, and I think um, under those state laws currently, you could put housing on in neighborhood business districts like Luna Park, 13th Street, um, Lincoln Avenue, um, Taylor Street in Japantown already to a certain extent if you provide um, under AB 2011 some level of affordability or all of it, it's affordability. Um, I think we'll talk about this more when the memo comes out. I think a couple things. One is that this would provide some standards about what the what the development would need to meet to be able to be go forward and be supported by staff and approved. So it, the bills don't have development standards, and we can apply development standards. So that's the critical thing: is we'll create development standards for for the housing. Um, so that really, I think, is the main thing. The other thing is that. Um, there's some question as to what degree SB uh, SB six will even be used because of, of the number of requirements in that bill. 
So I think uh, it's more likely that the affordable housing AB 2011 will probably result in housing. So there may be people that would be interested in building housing that do not want to take advantage of SB 6 for market rate housing, for example, and this would allow and facilitate that by providing development standards and a framework where they could actually propose housing. Right. No, I, I think we, we definitely need to, we need to do this right. I know that the housing crisis is it's a major crisis, but we have one of three Japan towns left in, in the United States, right? And we don't want that to go away, right? Um, and we have the longest, I think the longest, the, the oldest restaurant in the city of San Jose with Luz, with Charmonti's uh, uh, Deli in Luna Park. So, um, Item, thank you for that, by the way. Uh, item 36, does uh, the update on the zoning, does it include halfway homes? Because District 3 has a whole lot of halfway homes, especially around our San Jose State area. We'd have to get back to you. I think it's more of an issue of, I mean, a halfway house is, I think, a layperson term. I don't know if it legally meets the term of group home. Group home. Yeah. Right. So it, it very may, it depends on how you define a halfway house, but it, it probably. Right. There's a, there's definitely a mixture, right? We have, when, well, I used to work at a group home, right? And I worked with foster youth. So um, I know there's a mixture of them, right? There's the, the transitional ones, right? For folks in, in a sober environment. And then there are the, there's the other ones that with folks who are coming out of our uh, mental institute. So um, I know that there's just a variety and maybe, maybe if we can, we can talk offline about that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one we're required to do by state law and probably the, the definition of what we would define or what we define as group homes or people think of group homes probably in most cases meets the definition. I'm sorry, of a halfway house probably does meet the definition of a group home, but it, it depends, yeah. Okay, and, and then the other one is obviously um, item 41, because we're also, we're also dealing with it in, in District 3. Um, uh, can, can item 41, the update relocation assistance, be brought up at the same time that, uh, that the 12 urban villages um, with anti-displacement features as relocation assistance given to people who become displaced, we need to have this conversation concurrent with each other. I know I had a question in there. So I don't have a question in there, so I'm very sorry. But uh, item 41 is extremely important, right? As, as, uh, as, as we know um, that when, when folks are relocating, right, uh, and I mentioned it last week, right? We had, a lot of folks are we're still requesting a security deposit first month, last month, sweeping fees, backyard fees. There's a bunch of rental fees, right? I just want to make sure that our, that uh, we we are making sure folks are 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 staying and are able to stay in the city of San Jose. So. Thank you, and we hear your comment that you're concerned about displacement and concerned about the relocation assistance. Um, and for instance, as the soft story program was cited earlier, we're addressing uh, the need for people to get relocation assistance in the draft ordinance as well. So we're, this work item is about trying to enhance consistency across different programs of the city or different parts of our code. But um, but thank you for your interest in that. Great. Thank you, and that's it for me. Great. Thanks, Council Member. Vice Mayor. Great. Thank you so much. Um, my, uh, um, there's a lot of work here, and I want to thank you for all that you've done. Uh, my one um, concern is really on the soft story program. And I know that uh, we just recently applied for some potential grant funding to assist with this. I will tell you that with 30% of the apartments that are sort of in this category of soft story in District 1, I'm very, very concerned. I heard you, Kristen, say mandatory. 
And the minute that someone says mandatory, then you know people start asking me, what exactly is mandatory? What does that mean? And I think that as this ordinance comes forward, I understand that we want to um, inform, educate, and you know, in, in, inform the community, both renters and property owners. But it, you know, if there's a property owner that does not um, follow the ordinance guidelines or what have you, um, is there going to be a hammer? There are many properties that are just old, very, very old. And so I think that we have to be careful both for the renters as well as the property owners in terms of what does it mean to retrofit? How is that um, gonna happen? Is there a need for displacement uh, strategies? Is there, I think that there are gonna be a lot of questions that need to be answered before we start going out with a potential ordinance saying this is gonna be mandatory. Because if that's the case, then uh, I think that I see, as a, I see it as very problematic because the cost to someone potentially could be beyond their means. So, um, you know, and, and I know that, you know, many of the older buildings are the ones that are going to be the ones who are um, um, going to be hit with this. Right, so um, I, I would proceed cost with caution and which, uh, with a strategy of what are you gonna do to educate the community? How are you gonna help us help you get the word out? Uh, we know that in a disaster, I mean, we live in earthquake uh, country, uh, would be devastating, but at the same time, um, we have to understand the limitations that um, people have. So, you know, how do you balance that? And I think that the minute that you say mandatory, that sort of like makes people's hair on fire. So um, I think that we have to proceed with a way of how, how are we gonna solve this problem together as opposed to I'm gonna make you do this, right? So I just put that out there as a caution because I know that, you know, my phone is gonna be ringing off the hook. Um, so I, right. just, I just know that for a fact. Right, and a lot more to discuss on that topic because you're right, it's really balancing. Um, it's putting in place safety standards, but really balancing the interests of owners and residents. It's not an easy program to pull together, which is why it's taken some time. Um, I did wanna just note also for people listening that uh, there are many older buildings in our city, but only some are considered to be soft story part of the program will be determining which ones are as a, as a first step. Yeah. And then, um, and I don't know if Rosalind wants to join in on this, but um, I think the, um, the program elements are still to be discussed and decided by the city council um, as to, for instance, even if it were mandatory, how long would a building owner have to come into compliance? Right, but see, you didn't say any of that. You said it was going to be mandatory. And so when you say that, then that's a sort of predetermined, what are we gonna do, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that in most cases, there are um, examples of how it's been done in other, other areas, right? So, I mean, even for single family homes, they're uh, earthquake retrofit. So I think that, I'm just saying that um, the approach is gonna be just as important as the ordinance itself right, in terms of how you're gonna balance the two, whether you're gonna allow for a time for compliance or whatever it is that we're gonna do or what have you. But I do think that, that we should not get out the gate by saying, oh, we're gonna have this mandatory ordinance. You know, December will come, that ordinance will come, and you know, this place will be filled with people who don't understand what problem we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just, I just have seen this movie before. Yeah, thank you for your comments. And it is a safety and health measure first and foremost, and all of the devils are in the details. So you're, you're correct, thank you for your feedback. Great, 
Thanks, Vice Mayor. Uh, I want to thank staff again for the update and all the ongoing work we're doing to uh, prote protect and uh, preserve affordable housing, but also just build, build more housing at all that, that's affordable at all income levels. A um, lot of work to do. I'm excited about the mobile home park overlay. You heard some comments on that. And really excited about the opportunities in North San Jose. And while he's not here, I want to recognize Councilor Cohen for his leadership in uh, helping to move us forward in, in collaboration with, with partners over at the county. It's a really exciting opportunity. But I know there's much more on the list that you all are working on. So thank you very much. Uh, Tony, let's vote. Okay, it looks like that passes unanimously. We are on to open forum, which is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on any city business that was not on today's agenda. Tony, I'll turn it back to you. Jacob Sterling Silver. Hey guys, how you doing? Um, I'm Jacob Sterling Silver. I've been doing kind of some service work with veterans out of the Palo Alto Menlo Park VA, and I've been working with these guys for about seven years. And I noticed, man, a lot of these guys get bored. They're going through the recovery process, dealing with either addiction or PTSD issues. Um, it usually creeps up, in my experience, about five, ten years after their service. Uh, I, I come in contact with a lot of combat vets and special forces guys. We started a nonprofit last year just to try to get them out of the house and have some fun. And I got to tell you, it's been more effective than sitting in countless hours of, <laughs> of like group therapy with them. Um, I had a depressed veteran friend. I took him skydiving. He wasn't depressed when we hit the ground. Um, I, I took a guy to the range that hadn't been in five years and he had a great time. And he was uh, sharing with me that two deployments over there, that noise is in his head all the time, and we went out and shot some trap, and he said he loved it. It just quieted down that noise. So we're trying to do whatever the hell we can. Um, we cooked up some ribs at the uh, Santa Clara County Veterans Stand Down, passed out 300 pounds of ribs. It was great. Uh, Otto Lee came out with his family, had some ribs. Everybody loved it. So we're just trying to do anything we can do to try to combat what I call Treatment burnout. All fun, no play will kill a man's soul. Um, or all play with no fun, <laughs> you know. It's, it's a bad thing when they're getting poked at and the psychiatrists are digging up some of these uh, stories that are, that are bothering them. So I'm, I'm asking help from community cities. I'm going to go from San Francisco to as far down as my truck will take me. Um, I've hit a few other cities and I've gotten some good response. Anybody that would like to help or volunteer, I'm not a businessman. I'm not a doctor. I'm just a union iron worker. We build this, these places here. I don't know why these guys like me. I don't know why they trust me. They just do. And I've driven multiple guys to the east. Thank you. Oh, anyway, any help you can. I gave a hand out to her. Let me know. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Blair, followed by Colin User 2. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Um, I, I have a few comments. Though. I, I, my, my hand signal got, got mixed up during the uh, item on, on police issues. Uh, during uh, open forum tomorrow, rules and open government, I hope I can mention a few of my ideas and help uh, add to the process uh, overall. Um, I think, uh, as I, I think it was noted today uh, in my public comment, uh, you know, I'm really trying to work towards ideas of trust and, and, and communication and open dialogue. And I think the mayor proved he's having difficulties and fear in the subject matter I'm talking about. I'm trying to be open and informational and honest. Uh, and I don't like being shushed and, and, and turned off by the mayor. Uh, hope that's something we can work through. Uh, and it shows that we have something we really have to work through as a community process. When we start the process of trust and open dialogue, that's just all I'm going to be talking about uh, this fall. So good luck how we can do that together and build, build conversations. So um, 
Thanks for your time today, and uh, I'll be continuing talking about the importance of this subject matter and that we develop a better language in how we talk about our accountability issues. Uh, thank you. Calling user two on Zoom, followed by Guru Surrender in person, and then we'll go back to Zoom. Yeah, hi, Martha O'Connell. I am discussing the study session, which is scheduled for August 24th. And the purpose of the study session in pertinent part is, quote, promoting transparency and accountability, encur encouraging public participation, and reducing conflict and misunderstanding. I have been told that at some point during this meeting, the council members are going to break into small groups and I immediately sent an email and said, well, how are we gonna watch this? Because I'm interested in watching some of these small groups. And I was told by a city staffer in the city manager's office, for whom I have great respect, I'm not criticizing him, he responded, well, they're gonna get into these groups and then they're gonna come back and report what they said. Well, I question whether that is legal. I've looked at the Brown Act, it's not litigation, it's not personnel matters, you do have a way to do this on Zoom, so I would very much appreciate it instead of the council members going into a star chamber where we can't see and hear what's going on, that you have groups and that you, and that you let us participate. Hopefully in the group of our choice, I don't know if there's a way to do that or if you're just gonna assign people to groups, but it's gotta be a better way than you guys meeting where we can't see and watch what's happening and then you come back and report. So thank you very much for your consideration. I'm sure that with technology, you can make it happen. Thank you. Guru Surrender, followed by Paul. Hi, everyone. I wanted to address the uh, Buddhist temple um, plants that are set up for Evergreen Area, which was brought up last night. Um, so from the perspective of someone who has no attachment to worldly goods or any tangible things. Um, I have a different vision and see things a little bit differently. You all have proved something that the city does, the neighbors don't want there. What I see is a very wealthy man who has a lot of time and money who wants to build his wife a nice little palace up in the hills. And what I don't see emphasized is that they'll be serving alcohol there and there'll be a smoking area. I don't think that aligns with Buddhism in the way that I see Buddhism. And so that concerns me about the ad accidents. You can do whatever you want, but you can't get someone sober and help them make good decisions when you're feeding them alcohol. We have a problem with alcoholism and a lot of drugs and stuff. So the fact that you guys approve that is, doesn't make any sense to me. But more powerful than a man who's gonna build a temple for his wife is a father who built one for his daughter. And so I've declared myself king, and I'm gonna make sure everyone stays conscious and all of you guys stay conscious in your decision making. And my body gets weaker every single day that I don't see my son. And I want you guys to do something about it. Paul followed by Kamal Jeet. Uh, yes, also from Horseshoe, thank you very much for the last caller as well. Alcoholic. I know the kind of consequences that can happen as a result of the promotion of drinking and the consequences of drinking. So thank you for your comments. Secondly, I, am, I, I continue to be, and I, do, I mean this with no amount of flattery, but I continue to be impressed by the performance of my vice mayor. I am proud that she is my vice mayor. However, my mayor is, and, and, and I mean this as a citizen, and this is the proper form for this, is that I am embarrassed by my mayor. I have absolutely zero confidence in his ability to govern my city because he has demonstrated through his actions that he is incompetent and has failed to meet the needs of the very community that he serves. He swore an oath to uphold the Constitution. He swore an oath that he would be the mayor of all the citizens. But I think that he is shown by his actions and his inactions 
Media is not capable of that. With that said, I would love to see my vice mayor run for mayor. The city needs this right now because it needs a leader. It doesn't need a lack. It doesn't need somebody's lapdog beholden to the developers and the policies of the previous administration. I would Sam Ricardo really trash the city. And all, all my mayor's policies do is perpetuate that which he set forward. You think we're stupid with your Bellarmine connections and your Harvard connections and your connection to the Jesuit order? We are not stupid people. Vice, Vice Mayor, Mayor for 2024. Thank you. Kamal Jeet followed by Shahira. Hi, good afternoon, respected council members and honorable mayor. My name is Kamaljit, and I'm here to support Senate Bill SB 403, which is to end caste discrimination in California. This bill was introduced by Senator Aisha Bahab. I have experienced caste discrimination, and it is terrifying. And that is why I will request City of San Jose to consider supporting the bill SB 403 by working with Human Relations Committee so we can create a safe and non-discriminatory process that ensures safe participations for all. As caste oppressed people routinely, routinely face this violence just for coming out of the closet, caste oppressed community face same type of a discrimination as LGBT. Caste discrimination in California is real and it occurs across industries, including technology, education, restaurants, domestic work, and medicine. Caste discrimination against Dalit people, formerly called untouchable by dominant caste, includes bullying, harassment, bias, wage theft, sexual harassment, housing discrimination, and even trafficking. We need to end caste discrimination. We all deserve to live with respect and dignity. This bill is a civil rights bill, which protects all of us. It does not target any religion or anyone. This bill is supported by many organizations, such as American Bar Association, ACLU, Asian Legal Association, including the Asian Law Caucus, and South Asian Bar Association. We need to end caste discrimination and live without any fear. We came to United States to follow our dreams and to be free of any caste discrimination. The only way we can live freely, council members and mayor. Shahira followed by Raj. Hi there, good afternoon, San Jose council members and mayor. My name is Shahira and I am a caste oppressed woman. I am speaking on SB 403 the bill to end uh, caste discrimination, as mentioned by Kamalji, it was introduced by Aisha Wahab. Um, I'm also with the California Coalition for Caste Equity. I was born and raised in California and experienced caste discrimination um, specifically at a tech startup in San Jose. I was interrogated, harassed, and intimidated by my supervisor. He questioned my last name in order to figure out my caste identity. Last names can be a key ind indicator of caste. I have an ambiguous last name, which is Carr. I was repeatedly harassed by the supervisor, and when I told him I wasn't comfortable sharing my last name, he started treating me differently. Our workplaces must be safe places for all, our, all of our people. Caste discrimination is actively happening in the city of San Jose. San Jose is the capital of the Silicon Valley where over 6,000 tech companies reside. I urge the San Jose City Council to consider supporting SB 403 by working with the, D the DEI groups to create safe, sp safe spaces to discuss um, and pass the bill SB 403. Please stand with the caste depressed community and protect protect us by supporting SB 403. Thank you for your time and for listening. Raj followed by Mike.
Raj Kumar. Hello. Are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, my name is Raj Kumar. I'm from uh, Sacramento. I, I want to request to the city of San Jose to please support uh, Bell SB403. Uh, that's uh, uh, my Asha Baham Center. So we really, we really like uh, suppressed uh, in Asian community in Asia cast uh, cast of uh, like practices we don't want like same situation uh, america california we here suppressed uh, by caste dominant people in work and other places so our opponents they pretend as they are real bahujan but they are not we are the real bahujan we are so, so, like depressed class they are the upper layer we are the lower labor they are trying to like uh, get benefit the same as asian countries here. Uh, America is a free living country, so I want a uh, request to the like San Jose council members and other authorities to please support well S uh, SB403 to get it passed. Thank you very much. Mike followed by Vinny. Mike Sadegreen speaking as a resident. Um, I want to thank the city council and mayor for coming to a labor agreement with uh, with the city staff. Um, it's I, I understand it's going to be challenging to find funding, and I will try to remember that I'm saying this thank you if there's a trimming of services that affects um, the community. Um, but I do want to just say this. Um, there was a very positive, tangible result that I saw immediately afterwards, a San Jose city employee showed up at my house, signed off on the final permit for a solar system that we would like to think is gonna take greenhouse gases out of, out of the environment. And it put $800 in the San Jose treasury. That employee was happy for his fellow employees that the, that the problem had been resolved. He was grateful to his city. And I want you to know, I told him he did a great job and you guys did a good job making that happen. Thank you. Vinny, followed by Den Mosey. Uh, good afternoon, City Mayor and City Council. Thank you for taking my call. My name is Ashwinder Paul, and I'm with the California Coalition for Cast Equity and working on Center Bahav's new bill, SB403 to end caste discrimination. My family has experienced caste discrimination. It is, it is terrifying, and that is why we want the city to consider supporting the bill SB403 by working with DEI committee to create a safe process to discuss and implement the bill if it passes. In California, caste discrimination occurs across industries, including technology, education, construction, restaurant, domestic work, and medicine. Caste discrimination against oppressed people, Dalit, people formerly called untouchables by dominant caste, including bullying, harassment, bias, wage theft, sexual harassment, housing discrimination, and even trafficking. Thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity to, to share my thoughts and please support our bill, SB403, to end caste discrimination in state of California. Thank you. Then Mosey. Uh, good evening, Council and Mayor. It's a pleasure to be able to um, address you on the important issue of caste equity. My name is Tanmori Sandarajan, and I am with the Californian Coalition for Caste Equity, and we are proud sponsors of the bill SB 403 that we've been working on with State Senator Aisha Wahab. And it's just a serious issue that we're very lucky to be working on um, because as someone who's caste depressed, I have faced caste discrimination discrimination my whole life. I was bullied in K through 12. Um, I faced rape threats and death threats when I came out about my caste background uh, when I went to UC Berkeley. And I've continued to face discrimination as I've conducted advocacy about this issue. And in fact, last year had to live in a safe house 
because people who were bigoted on the issue of caste were trying to attack me and my family for coming out about this issue and helping people to um, understand how severe of a problem this is. This is why caste equity has so much support around the country, um, including the American Bar Association, the South Asian Bar Association, the ACLU, the NAACP, um, Asian Law Caucus, and hundreds of other organizations. And this is why we really want to implore the city of San Jose to be thoughtful when addressing this issue because it's very difficult for caste oppressed people to come out, speak our stories, and brave violence in order to be able to get legal remedies um, under the law. And the great thing about SB 403 is that we are simply clarifying existing protections. So we're not changing the law, we're simply making it more explicit. So we ask the city of San Jose to stand with us and to also consider ways to use the DEI committee to be able to help implement the law and to do so safely with empathy and a focus on healing. PK Danuka. Hello, this is Dr. Paul Danuka. I am a GI specialist, my wife is a cancer specialist. Uh, 28 years ago, we moved from India, escaping the caste discrimination so that our children can grow up in a better place and uh, uh, live like equal citizens. Uh, uh, and it has been a good journey. America has been great to us. And now I'm seeing that uh, same kind of uh, caste system is uh, coming to America as a lot of people are moving from there. Uh, for example, the first time we met, moved to a Northern California city in a, amongst a bunch of uh, 40 positions, uh, we had a dinner together to welcome us, and the first question they asked me after the dinner was, what is your cost? And I couldn't believe it. Guys, you couldn't leave it back, and you're still trying to bring it here. So it's very much here. If we don't take care of this now, this monster is going to grow in America, it's going to take over America as well. It's going to give a bad name to the Hindus, but it will also bring a lot of problems to American system. So please, I urge you to support the SB 403 to make the caste discrimination illegal. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you, Tony. All right, thanks all. We're adjourned. <laughs>